Thank you for this episode of tuning into this episode of Idleman Unplugged. I'm actually going to read. Uh, can I call you Doctor Doctor Paul? Doctor Paul, that's good. <laughs> uh, just uh, it's been getting to know you over the last few months has been amazing. Doctor Paul Brillhart is a distinguished physician with extensive qualifications, including board certification by the American Board of Family Medicine and fellowship with the Royal New Zealand College of General Practitioners and a board certification in nutrition with 40 years of experience in health care and leadership and management. So you currently practice as an integrative and functional medicine doctor in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And for people who aren't aware of that, I believe it's it's what functional medicine is identifying the root cause of the problem. That's you know, correct. Looking at, at what is what's the root cause and then diet, lifestyle changes, and of course, medication if needed. Um, he used the best of both traditional and alternative healthcare to provide wellness and a preventative program that best suits the individual rather than a one size fits all approach. And I love that. And I don't know, can you see the book here in, in your screen? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. I, that's, yeah. So that's this cool. book was amazing. The Lost, in case they can't, I'll, I'll do this. Uh, the Lost Art of Fasting in a Gluttonous World. The Lost Art of Fasting in a Gluttonous World. And I tell you what, I couldn't put that book down. I would say, uh, and not not just saying this because you're on the program, but it's it's probably the best fasting book I've read on when you when you talk about the scientific definition of autophagy and apoptosis and and telomeres increasing and brain derived neurotrophic factor and all these things I love from a Christian author or Christian doctor uh, or maybe a doctor who happens to be a Christian. I think there's so much here that we can unpack. But anyway, welcome to the program of Idleman Unplugged. And uh, we're going to jump right into this. Well, thanks, Shane. Um, and l let me say right off that I so much appreciate what you do. You're using all of God's gifts that he gave you. He's uh, He's using all of your experiences that you had. Yes. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very impressive, but it's just, uh, you know, um, it's it's good for the heart to see what you're doing and how God's using you and you're impacting a lot of people. You're impacting the body of Christ, but people outside there too. Right. But uh, anyway, it was a breath of fresh air, and that's kind of how we met. Because I um, there is there are no accidents, but coming across this video on YouTube, which we weren't even looking for, huh. and uh, <laughs> uh, I thought, oh my gosh, I've never seen a pastor do what you do. Uh, in the manner you do it, uh, with regards to fasting, we were we right. were talking about. So uh, that's how we kind of got connected. Yeah, uh, and it's, you know what's interesting is, um, like you said, God uses our experiences, and I think most people are beginning to realize the absolute vital. I don't even know if the word is the the incredible importance of taking care of our body. I mean, this is how we minister. This is how we parent. I mean. I think it's overlooked. And so when I, when I became a pastor, I, I started to talk about this a little bit. And then I, the fear of man, uh, because people say, you know what, pastor, what, that's not that important. Just stick with, you know, just this, just theology while this person's 80 pounds overweight and struggles with type two diabetes and they want. And so I just saw so many parallels and I've, I really felt God wanted me to get back and talk about this uh, because it's so important. Right. And, and the church is, uh, it's over the years, I've spoken in many churches um, on health and nutrition. Yeah. And it's, kind of, uh, it's, it's been one of those subjects that they just really don't like, um, you know, no, don't, don't, don't touch my sacred cow. Uh, don't talk to me about diet. And then for the most part, um, I'm not trying to come down on, on the oh, body, yeah, but yeah. The, They'll they'll give it uh, they'll give it lip service and they'll say, well, God just he loves me the way I am. Yeah. Don't talk to me about that. And and it's very hard for them to really see, you know, the importance of that. Uh, I mean, Paul talks about, uh, you know, disciplining himself. You know, he's he's fighting. He's he's yeah. uh, he's going to win that race. Uh, he's going to discipline himself. He's going to. Um, um, not be taken out by anything. And right. uh, no, you know, 
so all things are lawful, all things are not expedient, but I'm not going to be brought under the subjection of any. Yeah. So, so anyway, people aren't, they, you know, they don't take uh, things as serious as Paul. And, uh, well, that's for Paul, not for the body of Christ, you know. Uh, but no, the Lord calls us to be disciplined, uh, disciplined ones, disciples. Uh, he didn't, he didn't send us out to make believers. He actually said to right. go out and make disciples. And I mean, so, uh, oh, go ahead. I was going to mm-hmm. say, if you look at that verse, you know, when he said, I discipline my body daily and bring it into subjection, you know, obviously there's spiritual disciplines and things. Um, but if he's not talking about the lust of the flesh, I don't know what he's talking about. Obviously, I, I discipline my body and I bring it under control. So when I preach to others, I'm not disqualified because I'm that can be gluttony, addiction. So, I mean, this is such a big topic. And I've seen it where it actually affects who people are at a very deep level. You know, they struggle with anger. Holy Spirit, take this anger away. Well, you need to get off that 500 milligrams of caffeine and this junk food and get some sleep, some good sleep, deep sleep. And I mean, there's so many, so many things that you could look at there. Right. And and the church, um, uh, yeah, they don't talk about eating. They definitely don't talk about fasting and they don't talk about gluttony. Oh, true. Yeah. yeah. And they really don't think about that. Uh, I mean, at one point, uh, it's not in the scriptures, but, you know, they were talking about the seven deadly sins. I think the first yeah. one is called, was it gastromargia or something? That's gluttony. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but uh, they don't they don't think about the uh, the gluttony that was talked about in the Bible. Gee, our son is a a glutton and a drunkard. Well, we bring him out, and if he doesn't repent, he's going to be stoned. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a few other references, you know, in the but, yeah. Uh, Fasting again. I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here because you're well versed on all that. But what's well, good for people to hear? Yeah, the um, the body never thinks about that as far as taking care of um, who they are. That you know, again, Paul talks about your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and uh, we we need to maintain that. We need to take care of that. And he who defiles the temple, God will himself destroy. True. Yeah. Well, let's get into this. I think I'm going to title it something like the final or finally the truth on fitness. I know it's a little bold. Um, And I I actually have some notes. So I want to make sure I don't miss anything. We stay on track. Um, And I I, I mean, each of these each of these topics could be a podcast in them in and of themselves. So I'm thinking maybe just the the key points on each one to make sure we get through everything. Um, And again, I'm just want to highly recommend the lost art of fasting in a gluttonous world. I think that would really help a lot of people because you offer some solutions on that. But number one, um, why is there so much conflict when it comes to the area of health and fitness and dieting? You know, you've got paleo, you've got carnivore, you've got whole plant based only. And, I th- you know, me and you have talked about this. We're on the same page. I mean, biblically speaking, if people would just stick to the Bible, you know, biblically speaking, um, you know, there's there's some freedom there and not getting caught up in all the different crazes because a 30 day or 60 day diet is not going to fix a life, a lifelong problem. You know, it's a lifestyle change. That's right. And I, I kind of got into this uh you know, the backdoor approach. I wasn't planning on doing this. Um, I, I think I told you before, I wasn't planning on being a doctor. Right. Um, and uh, that, that's a long story, but it was the Lord and the Lord brought me into that. I didn't want to be a doctor, but now looking back, you know, yeah. Uh, thank you, Lord. Yes. Um, he, he knew exactly what I was supposed to do, but in that journey and part of that, part of that is in the book, as far as what I went through is, experiencing um uh things with patients uh i would pray for patients um i would try to figure out what was going on um uh the traditional approach didn't have an answer um the lord would just kind of drop a little tidbit into my head and uh wondering where that came from that's kind of how i got into integrative medicine yeah uh, functional medicine so once I, you know, I, I would apply this, the patient would get better, and then I would have to think about it. Well, what else don't I know? Oh, Lord, can, can you teach uh, me? Yeah. 
So, you know, he is the, um, he's the engineer of our body and he's the one that our diet. Yeah. And what I try and do with my page, you've been indoctrinated, you've been fed a lie. Right. Um, this, this thing that we call food really isn't food. Uh, it's fake food. Yeah, it is. And uh, it's a lot of chemicals. It's made by uh, food scientists. Um, for the most part, they uh, you know, they, they're not Christians. They don't believe in God and they don't realize what they're doing. And they, we're going to make it better. Okay. It's well, money. they never did. It's money, money, everything from seed oils to process. Yeah. And, and again, again, yeah, no, there's a lot of that. I mean, they're, they're very well intentioned. True. But well, when I got into medicine, when I got into medicine, I didn't know uh, the history of medicine so much. And I assumed that everything was up and up as far as how we were taught, what we were taught, okay. um, science behind it. I mean, we have a lot more science now than when we did. Well, you're thinking there, when it comes to the diet, though, would you say then, you know, the, the life-giving food, whole plant-based, even meat and dairy is controversial, but biblically speaking, you know, if it's clean. Um, and then you've seen the studies. There are studies out there that show moderate clean meat consumption is is good but then you you know you watch it forks over knives and what are these other documentaries i'm just like how do they get conflicting information are they looking at different things okay yeah they're they're making something that's simple very complex okay right. the human body is very versatile it's very adaptable and if you study people's groups uh, around the world, uh, it has been done going back to the 30s and 40s. Uh, oh, what's his name? Um, the dentist that went around. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know who I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I forgot his name too, but I'm sure we'll both. Yeah, but <laughs> I, I keep thinking of Herbert Shelton, but he was a fasting. No, no, he was, yeah, he was more fasting, but um It'll come to me afterwards. But anyway, he went around and studied all these people's groups. And this is back in the 30s, published, I think, early 40s. Yeah. And his conclusion was the American diet is way too processed. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay, so all of these people had different diets. They had different lifestyles, but they didn't have our diseases. So we have people that have, they're more uh, carnivore, and, they're, and then there are people that are more, more herbivore. And uh, then we have people that are kind of both like, you know, like the Hansa people, the tribes over in Tanzania and half the year they're more carny and the other herbs. And um, it's, it's interesting. They're healthy. And um, yeah, I remember one group he studied, they mainly their diet was mainly sweet potatoes and not much meat at all. And you would think, oh, my goodness, you know, all these carbs. Uh, but they're also very active. I think we forget that, too. You know, right. I look, I, not to interrupt, but I looked at my watch yesterday and I got in a full one mile of walking. I'm like, really? No, no that's all. That's it for the whole day. <laughs> really? I'm like, that's not good. I shoot for, you know, 10,000 steps and it's just, right, right. you're not, if you're not, you know, making it a priority, I think my point was a lot of these people were, were, were very active. I try to, um, I try to look at it from the Lord's perspective. Um, he gave us all of this food for our health. Uh, he designed it for our body, and if we follow those those uh, guidelines, uh, we don't we usually don't have a problem. What did Jesus eat? Oh, uh, well, was he, was he? Yeah, was he a vegetarian? No, he wasn't a vegetarian. I don't have anything against vegetarianism, but um, there's some little caveats. But uh, Jesus ate. He, meat, he ate meat. Um, some lamb, some beef. Not a lot. Um, and I don't have a problem with the carnivore diet either, except not for the long haul. Yeah, long haul, it's it's well, yeah. because the, it, well, it's, it's Weston A. Price. Yeah, that's that's it. Um, Weston A. Price. Yeah, his research was was pretty incredible. John the Baptist locust actually is 40, 50 percent protein. I don't know if people know that. It's very good, high protein food. Yeah, you ever tried it? No, I don't. I don't think I will. But I think the uh, is it the World Economic Forum wants us to all start yeah. eating insects. Uh, yeah. So, um, but yeah, that, so that's really the thing is moving more, 
and you're not you're not carrying extra body weight. I mean, that is huge. And then when you mentioned the processed food, that's actually one of my questions, the truth about cholesterol, because with the refined oils uh, and, you know, you've been the big thing now is the uh, uh, is it the APOB, you know, APOB, because the APOB is what brings the uh, LDL, the black cholesterol, which I don't think is bad. It brings that to the repair site and it repairs the inflammation. And so it's getting blamed for all the, the, the problems, but they're not looking at what's causing that damage in the artery. Cholesterol is not an evil molecule. It's one of the most important molecules in your body. Every cell needs it. Yeah. You no, know, if, if, if you take in, you know, if, if you take in, you know, I don't know, 300 milligrams, your body is going to, uh, of cholesterol, your body's going to manufacture another 800 from the liver. Right. And it's necessary for all your cell walls. It's, it's necessary for all your steroid hormones. Uh, it's for your brain. Uh, oh, and by the way, it's a uh, transport. <laughs> it's what? So, the transport, lipid agent? transport. So that's the cholesterol that we talk about. It's not cholesterol. It's lipoproteins. Right. Yes. So, uh, high okay. density lipoproteins, low density lipoproteins. Yeah. And the high density, just so people know, the high density is what brings the cholesterol back into the liver. Right. Where the LDL takes the cholesterol out into the bloodstream to repair. And that's right. why it's, it's called the bad cholesterol. And I never understood. I've actually checked my cholesterol once when fasting. It was high. I'm like, oh, my goodness, why is my cholesterol so high when I'm fasting? Well, it's because the liver is already producing. So you have to wonder all these diets, low fat, you know, instead of you know these cookies, crackers, all these, the low fat diet craze, getting rid of important monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, all getting rid of all these fats. And then now, now putting in partially hydrogenated oils, aspartame, red, red dye 40 coloring, monosodium glutamate, and all these things that are, that are not good for the body. A sticky topic. And most of my colleagues uh, are not going to agree with me on this, but um, somewhere in the nineties or something, I heard a lecture and they were talking about LDL and it was up on the big screen and they were talking about uh, pattern A, large, fluffy, buoyant, Pattern B is more dense. And then I was really confused. And I go, oh my gosh, you know, well, they're, they're both LDL. I thought L LDL was all bad. Yeah. Well, uh, it turns out that, you know, pattern A, a large fluffy buoyant, is driven by fat intake. Pattern B is driven by carb intake. Mm -hmm. Pattern B is the type that we find oxidized and in the arterial wall. Okay. We don't, find, we don't find the pattern A in the wall. So uh, people are uh, people are a little confused. Well, I heard that, and then I didn't hear anything more about it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, how can we never test for that? If if pattern B is bad, why don't we look at that? Well, it turns out if we really did that, a lot of people wouldn't be put on statins. So there are genetic components to this. Um, there are people that produce nothing but A for the most part. And then there's families that just produce B no matter what they do. Um, so just, we have- Just to bring in a point of clarification, the A is the, what, when you call it the tighter, more dense uh, particle in the lipo, in the LDL, that's the one well, causing damage where the fluffier B is the one that's not. No, no, it's the opposite. Opposite. Okay. Okay. Opposite. Okay. The A is large fluffy. Oh, okay. And, okay. And the B is small, hard dense. Okay. So if we could break down well, those. That would be more, that would be more advantageous to see exactly what, what type is in a person's blood. Stream. Right. And so, well, I, I was a little confused. Well, why haven't I heard anything more about this? Hmm. But, um, uh, for instance, um, using an example of a patient that came into me, she says, well, um, I, I know you're going to want to put me on a statin because everyone wants to put me on. She's 35 years old. Her oh. cholesterol is a little over 400. And her LDL was 256. And I... Oh, I that's, yeah, that's up yeah, there. So, so I said, well, I, I understand. So... Um, Tell me this, uh, does anyone else in your family have high cholesterol? And she says, everyone. I go, everyone? She goes, everyone. 
<laughs> Next question. Uh, is there heart disease? She goes, not a soul. Uh, extended family? No. So I said, well, we have to break down your cholesterol. Yeah. And so when she comes back, <clears throat> um, I, I know I mentioned this to you before, the NMR lipoprofile. Yep. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So um, that's breaking it down into the particles. And so her LDL particle was somewhere around 2,000. Or, and that's a really high number, by the way. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very high. And of her, her pattern B was about 78. And the rest of all those were all A. Now, if you get below about, I think it's about 550 or something like that on your B, mm -hmm. you're, you're doing good. Um, anyway, she's at 78. Wow. Okay. Her average particle size uh, for LDL, this is all comers, she was slammed up against the wall over here. I've never seen someone with a particle size that high. So it was all it was all pattern A. So and, no wonder. And just to clarify, because a lot of people, you know, they're, they're not quite sure what we're talking about. The bottom line is, although she had high cholesterol, when you broke down the particle sizes, it was actually the type of cholesterol that's not binding to the artery walls. So she probably would. Yeah. That's why it doesn't heart disease doesn't run in her family. Yeah, so, and yeah. and the other the other factor is that the LDL pattern B isn't really a problem until it gets oxidized. And oxidized is when it is oxidative stress. When it's well, well, oxidative stress. Yeah, oxidation is rust. But if you have free radicals. Oh, yeah. through your blood, uh, that's going to oxidize. So, uh, you know, some bad food, bad food it, is it's free. Yeah. 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 Uh, deep, deep fried foods. Um, you can, you can take, um, you can take a group of 10 year olds and you can uh, go to their classroom and you can do a little Doppler on their artery and check their blood flow. Yeah. And, and you break the group in, uh, you know, into twos where, uh, half are going to go out and eat, uh, you know, a candy. No, <laughs> a, um, a big uh, extra serving size of fries. Okay, okay. Out of, uh, Wendy's or McDonald's, wherever. And the other group is just going to get the equivalent in the vegetable oil. And of those, of, the, of those two, which one's going to have a change in their blood flow? Well. After two hours, you, you measure their Doppler and you're going to see the little, you know, flow. Mm -hmm. And um, the group with the fries has dropped down about 30 percent or so in their blood flow. And the other group hasn't changed any. OK, why? That's acute endothelial oxidative stress. Of Dude. these oils from the fries. Uh huh. And so you're just you're scouring your million miles of blood vessels with free radicals. Now, oh, what does that do to the endothelial cells? Well, they can't they can't release nitric oxide. Right. And just so people know, the endothelial cells are the cells within the lining of the arteries. Right. Exa I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. I'm just trying to bring it down to the right. 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 So the endothelial level, you know. inside the arteries and the endothelial cells, they release nitric oxide, which, you know, that's that's uh, that relaxes. Good. So yeah. Possible, uh, nitric oxide. So it's released with uh, Viagra. Okay, yeah. it's yeah. A, it causes dilation of blood flow. So anyway, and I want to I, I pause for a minute because this is I think this is one of the most critical points you've made. The, the with the French fries, different things. Those chemicals, the way the carbohydrates are even produced, the 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 sodium. It's not even normal sodium. The type, all of that now that's in your blood is basically. It reminds me of sandpaper kind of going through and damaging the artery walls. So I think right. it's important for people. Right. That's right. why bad food, where if you take a grass-fed buffalo with some avocado, that fat is just, it's more smooth and, and it's not causing the, the damage, the uh, the uh, sandpaper against the artery walls. I mean, that that is, that is I hope that gives that, people that, a good vision. That's, um, that's a good analogy, yeah. Um, when uh, he, you've got blood flowing through your, through your arteries, at lickety split, I mean, it's very fast flowing. And you've got to have smooth 
arteries. You have to have no defects, otherwise you get flow uh, <clears throat> imbalances. So anything happens where you get a ding in that wall, um, the body's going to try and repair itself. Yeah. And this is part of where the cholesterol and entering the picture. Uh, cholesterol isn't the perpetrator of the crime. He's uh, at the scene of the crime. You know, he yeah, might be a getaway. He's a, he's a getaway driver. But I like that. I like that analogy because we everyone makes it the bad guy there. You know. Yeah, and it's it's it it looks like it's more of a part of a healing response. So the the problem isn't cholesterol. It's, it's well, how did we get there in the first place? And then you have the glycocalyx. Um, I think that's what it's called. It's the it's the coating on the inside of your arteries. And it's a protein in glyco, and you might have a, a sugar component, but it uh, is it coats, it's, yeah. like it's kind of like a film. So if you pick up a fish out of the water, yeah, what do you notice first? Yeah, the slippery. Slimy. Okay, well, that slime enables that fish to go through the water. Right. Okay, that's what's lining all of your arteries. Right. Okay. And so, well, what can damage that? Okay, you know, the bad food. But if you have high sugar levels, especially diabetics, uh, it thins out that glycocalyx. And that glycocalyx acts as a protection, uh, a, pr a protecting factor. And if you thin that out or really get it down, you're much more apt to damage the arterial wall. So you end up having the uh, little dings, nicks, um, right. maybe at the bifurcations. Um, right, right. So anyway, um, back to that, that whole picture with LDL and um, <clears throat> the fractions of that. Um, if we were to look at what statins do, statins will lower both kinds, but they actually lower A more than B. And I want that. Yeah. Okay, well, the, the yeah, but the 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 A is driven by fat, but we have been driven to believe that okay fat is what causes heart disease okay so i mean, i you know this and i i think i mentioned it in the book as well and that was you dealing with the seven country study yep Different. and uh you know i i brought up that you know minotti who was one of the co-authors uh the italian he went back in uh, i think it was 99 and he looked at their data well they really hadn't looked at their carb data they were so focused on proving that wow. saturated fat was was the causative factor that they never looked at their carb data. So 78, 99, okay, so 21 years later, he goes back and looks at their data and says, oh my gosh, small correlate with the fat, large correlate with the carbs. Okay, and so... You never heard about that. The public didn't hear about that. What would that mean to the common person that the carbs, more too many carbs were driving? Right. So, well, well going back to, um, you know, the, I don't know, the mid 60s, we started coming into this idea and they were debating it and they didn't know which way it was going to go. Is it is it the carbs or is it the fat? And oh, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, there were people that had the, um, the idea it was the carbs, but, um, Ansel Keys, who was behind that study, um, he firmly believed it was all about it was all about uh, the fat and the saturated fat caused it. So he set that study up, and I, I looked at the study, and I looked at some data prior to the study, and I know that he kind of cherry picked the the countries. Yeah. He eliminated uh, two of the countries in Europe um, that had the highest consumption of saturated fat. Mm -hmm. It also had the lowest incidence of heart disease. Yeah. Uh, France uh, and even the French smoked more than the rest of Europe. Right. But they had the lowest heart disease. Right. And the highest saturated fat. And Germany was a follow up to that. So, but so but, we, well, I was going to mention because we mentioned antioxidants. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have a closing point on that one? Well, well. Anyway, the 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 sugar. <laughs> The Sugar Council, they um, they paid a lot of money. They buried the um, evidence. The, the guy that had the uh, study over in the UK uh, uh, showing just the opposite. And everyone went along with this uh, 
mantra that, you know, saturated fat is bad and it causes heart disease. And there you go. But at the same time, uh, we knew about the Eskimos and their 80% fat intake, saturated fat on top of that, well blubber, seal blubber, yeah. and they have no heart disease. And they don't have stroke risk. Well, they have minimal thromboembolic stroke risk. Ours is over 700% above theirs. And heart disease, it really doesn't exist. But if you take them off the tundra and you feed them our diet. Here it comes, yeah. Yeah, and within within 10 years, they're having heart attacks and strokes. So if I went back to that, the best diet that we initially started to talk about, it would say, obviously, what works for a person, but a, a, enough whole plant-based food, you know, the, 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 the veggies and the fruit, you know, in moderation, of course, but also to possibly bring in some clean meat, a little bit of clean dairy, and then get more active. Basically, good food in moderation and more activity. Yeah. Right. You. Okay. Right. Yeah, I, I don't tell my patients. I, I I always tell them, look, I'm not telling you to eat like an Eskimo. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to do that. But I will tell them the culprit isn't what they make them out to be. The, um, the, the fat isn't the problem. Now, there are good fats and bad fats. Right. And um, no, you don't need so much uh, saturated fat. And not all saturated fat is the same. But I, I try to get a moderation. So, okay, the you know, the, the meat, um, the vegetables, the fruits, the nuts, the seeds, I try to get a balance. I'm pretty much more of a Mediterranean type, yeah. except I don't, I don't hold to the Mediterranean diet that most Americans think is a Mediterranean right. diet. Yeah. 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 And I'm looking at whole foods. I'm looking at, uh, the foods, they're not processed food. They're not, um, made up food. I'm trying to get as much um, natural whole food as I can. Right. But uh, everything's in balance. And that's the key. Uh, yeah. And as I mentioned, man is very, very versatile. They can, they can adapt and uh, yeah. like, like the sweet potatoes. <laughs> and you mentioned earlier the, uh, you know, so people know free radicals are, um, they're basically, um, they're missing, was it a proton or something? And, and so they're, they're, uh, they're it's a, yeah, it's an electron unpaired. Electron, yeah, unpaired. And so they're bouncing around and we've got all these free radicals. And what you mentioned is that this type of diet is actually very high in antioxidants. So the antioxidants give that free radical, they help, they help balance out that, um, it, it's not a free radical anymore. It becomes very stable. And so all this food that we're eating, the Doritos and the Dr. Pepper and the even bread, uh, just normal bread, um, crackers, cookies. I mean, just about 90 percent of what we're eating is processed food, which is delivering even more free radicals into the body. And so we can easily right. see. Right. You know. Right. Yeah. And I get, and uh, if I can take a step back you know, to the mid sixties, when this debate was going on, they started telling people fat was bad. Okay. So fat was dropped out at your little pie graph, proteins, fats, carbs, um, the fats were shrunk. So the vacuum was filled in immediately with carbs and you can plot it out. At, you can see the diabetes going up and the heart disease going up and hypertension was part of heart disease. Uh, you, you start seeing the cancer go up. You start seeing everything go up, including Alzheimer's dementia, yeah. which is related to its um, type three diabetes, insulin resistance. Right. Absolutely. Uh, it's, that's not the cause of Alzheimer's. It's one of the big factors that feeds the whole thing. But um, it, the diet kept changing and we thought, uh, you know, it was going to be better, but it never stopped. Even when they brought to the, attention i remember in 2002 um uh they came out with the the international congress of um diabetologists they said wow if we don't do something uh the kids born this year um by the time they reach adulthood uh we're gonna have oh huge numbers up to you know 30 40 50 percent are going to be diabetic well those kids from 2002, now they've reached adulthood. Yep. Okay. And guess what? You know, now we're looking at 
you know, easily 50, 52% of the U.S. population is diabetic or pre-diabetic. Right. And, and, and then you say, well, well, pre-diabetes isn't diabetes. Well, I, I beg to differ. It is. It shows all uh, the signs. You know, the we didn't know when we determined, you know, um, say a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 is, that's the number right there. That's when you become a diabetic and we'll give you your certificate there but the pathology starts back at pre-diabetes you know so 5.7 to 6.4 and the prime driver of coronary artery disease happens to be insulin resistance yeah so so true you know even you know the apoe4 gene that is driving alzheimer's it, it also drives coronary artery disease it's linked with that well both of them have in common insulin resistance. Talk a little bit about fasting and uh, replacement therapy, hormone replacement therapy. And it might be good to mention too, that you're, you're, the type of practice you do, you don't take on new clients uh, because I can imagine, you know, uh, people after hearing this are wanting to get in touch with you, but I think you're more dealing with specialty type issues now, correct? I, yeah, I don't have an open practice. Okay. And uh, no, I'm happy to, <laughs> I, I'm uh, I'm happy to do this, and I'm happy. Right. That's to what I'm saying. Yeah, this should this should help. And a lot of people, I've you know, because I help a lot of people with health and nutrition too. Uh, obviously, not knowing as much as a doctor, I'm kind of know a lot about a lot of different things. If they can begin eating healthy, um, moderation, cutting out sugar, and even intermittent fasting, getting active, and start to really take care of the body, a lot of their issues. Um, really, I mean, that's the core of it. And I think a lot of us know that, but we want that, we want that pill. If I can just take that pill, then I can enjoy, you know, yeah. all these other right. things. Right. And that's, uh, that's what we've kind of been indoctrinated, uh, in the sense that, uh, the answer to everything medically is pill. And yet that's, that's a paradigm. I try to get my patients to break, uh, yeah. cause that's not, uh, that's not real at all. Um, no. We were, um, the, the whole pharmaceutical industry isn't interested in any of this. Right. Um, and our, uh, there, there's so much money invested in the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry. Um, the doctors out there rank and file are never going to receive any of this. They're not going to hear this. Right. Um, is it being taught in the medical schools? Absolutely not. Uh, absolutely not. Um, there's a few exceptions, uh, but to this degree, no. And there's uh, a lot of, I mean, people waking up, you know, Peter Atia, Dr. I think it's Paul Saladino, you know, of course yourself, um, a lot of the videos, Ben oh. Greenfield, Gary Brecka, Huberman, uh, his podcast, and, you know, it's getting the message out there for sure. There, there are, there are tens of thousands of us out yeah. there. Yeah, uh, that uh, integrative functional medicine doctors and people even uh, there's uh, naturopaths and other uh, <clears throat> other practitioners of health, um, and some of whom you just mentioned. Uh, you have other people, many others, uh, yeah, uh, other other uh, uh, PhD researchers that are bringing this stuff out. Um, you know, uh, Walter Longo, uh, yeah. you know, bringing some of this stuff out. Um, but, but for the most part, we, we've been sold this, uh, idea about drugs and drugs are the answer. And here, this whole thing, this was, this was the beauty of fasting was this is engineered into your body to do this. And yeah. we'll say, well, well, how can you say that? Well, I, I happen to know it was engineered, but, um, the the whole thing uh for instance autophagy okay now what does autophagy do it do it uh it optimizes your cellular function it cleans the house it gets rid of oxidized broken parts cleans the place out uh brings your energy levels up inside the cell it optimizes functionality okay and then it's going to clean out the uh with mitophagy it cleans out your weak sick oxidized broken you know leaking mitochondria need to be taken out wow. and that leaves room so we can restore them okay yeah. and that's where the exercise comes in and we we stir up uh, mitochondrial 
application. But if we don't have that, uh, that mitosis in that cellular house cleaning, wow, um, that never happens. And so people live inside this vehicle of theirs for how many years? And they've never done that. But they were they were taught that you have to eat three meals a day, snacks, and uh, keep fueled, never skip a meal. Yeah. Uh, and all of that was not really true. And it's not really based on anything. I still, I mean, uh, some of our colleagues out there, they're still saying, well, I don't know whether it's really good to skip breakfast. You know, breakfast is is bad. And they, they quote they quote some of the, the studies, like it comes out of the American Heart Association. It wasn't a study, it was an observational. Did they actually look at the types of diets? They found out, so oh, oh, the people that are skipping breakfast. Well, yeah, but if you look at their their energy... Um, they're going to McDonald's later, right? Or- well, the, the amount of carbs that they're taking in, their sugar index is very, very high. Well, those are the people that are going to have bad problems, okay? Yeah. Um, we we actually did better as a country when we were doing, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, no snacks. And so it was basically giving you a, uh, say, a 14-hour fasting window. Okay. So if you eat dinner at 6 and you eat breakfast at right, eight right. Or something like that. So actually, we, we actually did much better. What were you going to say? Yeah, well, I'm trying to find that. I mean, people have been sending me all week that that news headline that 91 percent increases your heart uh, heart attack rate by 91 percent now with intermittent fasting. No, just, I don't no. know if you've seen that. It's just well, no, I, I didn't. I didn't see that, but I did, I did kind of dig up the studies. In fact, I think I even have it on my desk here. I'm going to try to. Uh, you know, it's let me add to that too. My dad died uh, a younger than me. He was a year younger than where, where I'm at now. And he didn't eat breakfast. So he would, you know, but what was his breakfast? A pot of coffee. And people forget that coffee is essential nervous stimulant. It curbs hunger. So also how many of these people, okay, they skip breakfast and, and but look at their whole lifestyle, you know, Right. Pot of coffee, stressed out. Then you go eat junk at lunch. You know, I, I think just the correlation of reading the article is just right. so misleading. Well, so misleading. well, yeah, no, it's very misleading. And, and you get a lot of these observational studies that uh, they're horribly set up. And I thought, I'm thinking, well, who paid for that? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, okay. Uh, I mean, okay. The American Heart Association I mean, they're the ones that put this out, and this was on one of their sites, and it, it was saying, well, you know, it looks like you might have increased cardiovascular disease. Right. Well, that's uh, it's ridiculous. Um, the, the American Heart Association, back in 2017, you're familiar with the Pierce study? No, I'm not. Okay, it's it's it was a 10-year nutritional study. It's looking at fats, carbs, and mortality risk, okay? So we're trying to keep it simple, fats, carbs, mortality. And so they always said, you know, well, your your study wasn't long enough. Well, this is a 10 year long study, okay? And then they would say, well, your cohort isn't large enough. Okay, well, this was over uh, 138,000 people. Uh, Well, it's not diverse enough, bioethnic diverse. Okay, well, this is in 19 countries, five continents. Okay, all right, okay. And we're trying to keep it simple. Let's just look at fats, carbs, mortality. So the synopsis in the abstract, if you look it up, it'll say, okay, overall mortality was higher in the high uh, high carb diet, which is the diet. And fats, specific types of fats, were not associated with increased cardiovascular disease, increased myocardial infarction risk, or increased cardiovascular death. Similar endpoints, but a little different. But they all pointed to, no, there's no correlation. Now, uh, the kicker was the first correlation between saturated fat intake, saturated fat intake, and stroke risk. Mm -hmm. Whoa, that's 180 degrees from what we've been taught. Hmm. And, you know, think of the Eskimos. Okay, saturated fat, they have no stroke. 
Okay, right. it's right. almost yeah. done. Okay, well, that was in that was published in the Lancet in November two thousand seventeen. I was still living over in New Zealand at the time. Right. I I, I, I knew it was coming out. I saw it and, and uh, I thought, wow, I already have almost two dozen studies on my desk saying the same exact thing, but this is a big study. And the next month in December, the American Heart Association, they put out a press release. We want everyone to know that you need to cut out saturated fat from your diet because it causes stroke risk. Well, excuse me, isn't that what you've been saying for 50 years? Yeah. Yes, it is, but it's time that we remind everyone. Yeah. Okay. No, uh, you know, they read the study and they want everyone to know. So fast forward to June of the next year in 2018, uh, the um, International Cardiology Conference over in Germany. I was um, I was kind of trolling in there and looking at their chat rooms and no one wanted to talk about the in the room. The wow. pure study, the pure wow. study. No one wants to even talk about it. why you're going to lose your license yeah you're, you're, you're going to lose your tenure you're going to lose your research you're going to lose yeah. you know everything okay no one's going to talk about it isn't that a shame yeah that's right. okay and then you then you look at the people trying to poke holes in it uh and they couldn't no there's no no way around it yeah yeah so anyway this is I, i'm saying the american heart association well who is paying them right right and you look at their funding you look at their funding and of course, you know, I, I don't know why they want to come out and say, well, the uh, uh, intermittent fasting is bad and it's going to kill you and give heart disease. Well, you already know by reading, you know, what I've written. Yeah. That it's tremendously beneficial to your heart. And just so people know, you made a good point. The longer now there's a, a period there where if you go too long, of course, but the longer you go, there's your, your your insulin is less, your spike in blood blood sugar levels, the heart is more relaxed, there's less toxins in the body. You said the mitochondria, which is in the cell, is being cleansed. Um, you know, autophagy with the self-consuming. That's what the word means. It means it's going through right. it's consuming. So if you're eating, you actually you can't have both. I maybe maybe a slight degree, but you can't have both autophagy and cleaning going on if you're constantly eating. I mean, it's just right. One or the other. So, I mean, it just, um, well, and even biblically speaking, I yeah. mean, you don't have to eat every, I don't think they had an AM, PM on every corner. No, no. I, uh, I, I tell my patients, look, this is the default state of man. And they're going, what? Okay, look, 8 billion people on the planet, most of them live this way. What? Well, not intentionally, not knowingly. Right. They just don't have a fridge, a pantry, uh, you know, a, a quick trip, fast food, right? Uh, grocery stores full of processed food. No, they don't have that. And so they might eat, they could eat three meals a day, but they could eat two meals or one meal. or, And that's the way mankind has always lived. Right. right. We, we here in this country, we're the oddballs. Yep, we are. We've gone, we've gone to the extreme, but... Um, to go back to the note, you know, about all these things that happen and these benefits, um, you know, when you, when you do fast, it, um, it has an effect after you fast, your growth hormone goes up and it goes up significantly. I don't know if you've looked at those. percent, right? And it's, it, yeah, it's, it's like, it's like 15 hours or 24 hours or 36. Yeah. And so you get all of these these incredible benefits. And what does that translate to? Increased stem cells. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Um, but we're talking, just to clarify, we're talking primarily at this point, if people can just drink water because they're wondering, oh, can I have lots of juice? Well, there's your fructose and your insulin. And I mean, we're talking about mainly just, just having water to get that deep cleaning. Um, and I know different right. people, I mean, 12 hours, 16, 24 you know, there's so much we could go into what you did in your book. I have as far as, you know, talk to your physician. What medication are you on? Uh, there's some people that shouldn't fast if you're having kidney issues and because your kidney is going to work over. So there's but we're talking about the average person. Try going 12, 16, 24 hours just drinking water. I mean, is that the that I'm sure because people want some practical application, too. Yeah. And I 
Yeah. And that's exactly what I have my patients do. And I tell them, look, I don't expect you to start off with this. Some of them decide they're going to do it. You know, I'm going to go for it. And I go, yeah. oh, it's kind of hard if you're not used to it. Yeah. And it takes, uh, it takes a little bit of uh, uh, turning on the genetic machinery. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so to get going. Jones. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I tell them, eh, start off with, you know, if you're at 12 hours, I go, anyone can do that. I go, go to 14. I'll work it out, go to try to going to 16. I like 18. Okay. But oh, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not fixed on that. Um, there are a lot of people that like the 20 hour four, well, 20 hour fasting, four hour window. Right. And uh, that's fine too. I don't have a problem with that. As long as they're getting all the nutrient, uh, the nutrients they need. And that's, and that's, yeah. that's kind of the key though. I mean, drink, uh, Fasting, um, well, we're talking a short intermittent fast there, but making sure they're getting nutrient dense foods and adequate protein. And I know um, we'll talk about that after. But also, what about extended I, fasting? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's what I was going to say was the um, the the three to four day, and I have people do that. And but even the most staunch people that they could never go past twelve hours, and they're shaky and sweaty and headachey, and okay. They come back to me and they say, you won't believe what happened. And I go, mm. and they tell me that, oh, yeah, I, I went 24 hours. I finally made it there. And then I went to 36. And then I went and then they come back and they say, hey, uh, hey, my wife and I, we just finished a four day fast. And I go, what? And they, well, you told us about it. And I go, well, yeah, I didn't expect you to do it, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I mentioned I mentioned in the book about uh, autoimmune disease yeah. and this one couple that I just mentioned, uh, you know, he had rheumatoid arthritis and he says, this is crazy. Uh, so after months, he says, um, my injections, these big expensive drugs that he was having to pay for the, the time interval, you know, because he was, he was going injection to injection and having pain halfway through the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And he says, now I can go to the point where I'm not having any pain and I don't know that I need the injection. Well, his blood markers were fine. Um, it was uh, remarkable. So he says, wow, so if I just periodically do this, it seems like I can downregulate it. But it's, it's a very complex thing when you're dealing with the immune system. Okay. But... Is it autoimmune? Isn't that the number one prescription? The, the, what we have to take the most prescription for is right now is autoimmune disease. Uh, the top. Well, the top. the most the most expensive ones. <laughs> yeah, and they're caused by either toxicity, toxicity, right, or deficit. One of the if there's nutrient nutrient deficits or toxicity building up in the thyroid or different areas. Uh, with with regards to autoimmune. Yeah. It's 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 linked mostly with the gut. Okay, yeah, gut bacteria microbiome. Okay, the uh, the in it's the interaction of the immune system with <clears throat> um, within <clears throat> excuse me the gut wall, and uh, it's 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 rather complex. But uh, you. It has to do with the microbiome and the wrong bacteria proliferating uh, intestinal ability, inflammation of the gut lining and uh, proteins leaking across or partially digested proteins leaking across, interacting with the immune cells and you end up having this thing. So uh, this thing start with your immune system attacking uh, yourself. There's so, so many other factors. Okay. It's yeah. it's. it's it's mind blowing, but mind with, mind. The, with the intermittent fasting though, or fasting or the autophagy, what it, it does is um, when, when you go into fasting, uh, it causes your, uh, oh my gosh, it, it causes your monocytes to go down. It causes your mTOR, which you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. Your mTOR is downregulated. Um, it activates AMPK. Um, so you're going to go more towards um uh, m2 macrophages which are uh that's those are your healthy macrophages um uh as 
to the M1 and M1 is just the opposite. So when your mTOR goes up, your M1 goes up and you don't want the M1, it's inflammatory. But the, uh, the fasting uh, triggers down regulation of your um, uh, T17 cells with autoimmune disease and T17, you've heard of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it it changes the Treg to T17 ratio. And and, um, and with that imbalance, when you get the the imbalance, you end up increasing that. But this is part of how this this happens. Uh, The the CERT1 gene, which gets flipped, that's the anti-aging gene, of course, but the CERT1 pathway, uh, it gets flipped and all these crazy things happen. So you get um, what hypoxia inducible factor, alpha, one alpha, something like that. Uh, that causes a uh, down regulation of your T17. Okay. Those are the ones that are driving this autoimmune. So immediately this patient is going, wow, what, what happened? Mm-hmm. I, I've had that happen with, uh, you know, I've, I've treated many uh, patients, but if I can get them into this, I'll put them on a seven to 10 day water fast. And people say, well, that's crazy. I mean, just the idea of, of going, but you, you know, you've done this. And once you go past about two days, um, your ketones are high enough and it shuts off, you know, your appetite's gone. Yeah. Your energy is still there. Um, your mind is very clear. And people will think, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm going to lose all my muscle. Well, you don't lose it that quick. How much How much really do you lose? Don't. I've been meaning to ask you that. What would you say in a one-week fast? I mean, because there's your body goes into muscle sparing mode because of our creator. You know, he right. our muscle spare. But, however, I think in that process, isn't there a little bit of gluconeogenesis where, you're, where your muscle is broken down? But you, do they ever know? Because I've seen other, like um, Buchenheimer in Germany has 250 calories of juice. They say there's hardly any muscle broken down. No, there's very little initially. And then you start breaking it down the longer you go into it. Okay. But if you're, doing, if you're doing a seven day, you're really not, that's really not a long, yeah. super long fast. True. Um, uh, but I mean, I, I know you've done longer fast and um, uh, I mean, it, it's, how, it, how, it, what was that? How, how would you encourage someone to just, you know, they, to, to would you say wean off, begin weaning off of coffee and sugar and processed food so it's a little more pleasant? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, why people, that's why people don't fast. I mean, hunger is one thing, but to me, yeah. to me, hunger is nothing compared to the withdrawal symptoms. Right. Of, you know. Right. So, so I tell them, look, this is all overwhelming. Okay. Uh, you know, when you get this information, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. Oh my gosh, I can't do all this. No, it's really, it's really simple. It's not rocket science. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just basic principles. Um, and I tell them, I don't look, I, I don't teach diets. I teach lifestyle principles mm-hmm. and diets all work. They all fail, but this will work for you. I want you to take one step at a time. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I'll take them off. Okay. Uh, something simple. Oh my gosh. Sodas. People drink sodas. Okay. Uh, or they're drinking a lot of fruit juice. Mm-hmm. Well, it's natural. And I thought, well, you know, it's, I mean, is it, is it natural to, to like eat six or eight oranges at one time? No. I go have an orange. Yeah. And I tell them, look, just make a few little steps. And if you can do that, you know, small, sure, steady steps lead to success. Okay. That's what I want you to do. And, you know, I, I just keep them on a, a a short lead and I I bring them back and, um, you know, the shortest or the, the, the longest would be four weeks. I bring them back at four weeks at least, Mm -hmm. but if I need to uh, even shorter, but I'll just say, this is what you do next. This is what you do next. But I try to extend their, um, you know, their little uh, fasting window farther and farther along. And of course, that is, you know, you're hitting the cert one gene, which is turning on insulin sensitivity. It's uh, your your fat burning is also being optimized. It's like going to the gym. You know, you, you go once a month, you're not going to see anything. If you go two or three times a week, you're going to start seeing changes right away. So I tell them, this is what you're doing. You're training your body and it will adjust. And that's why... 
Uh, oh, for instance, people doing the keto diet, they, they start and they get the keto flu. What is the keto flu? Okay. Adapting. Yeah. Yeah. Your body's adapting headaches, sweats, nausea. Oh, I feel awful. I've got the keto flu. Well, that's just turning on the machinery. Now you can do it slowly. You don't have to go into it. Um, um, full course, but it usually disappears after about five days. Yeah. And that's, uh, we'll tell people that, but, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing, uh, uh what people can do. I mean, uh, the, uh, you know, be it reversing diabetes or reversing hypertension, or if they're doing it for weight loss, uh, or I'm doing it for autoimmune disease, or I'm doing it for, my gosh, I'm even doing it with my cancer patients, yeah. which is, which is crazy. But, um, uh, example with, uh, you know, some guy that came in, uh, with a big guy from Barbados and he had uh, hypertension, he was obese and he had diabetes uncontrolled on medication. So I just kind of gave him these principles and I didn't see him again for five months. Wow. And, and he comes back in and, and I check his A1C and I go, it's the same as mine. Okay. Wow. And he says, I stopped my medication. I stopped my, my diabetes medication. Well, before, you know, I think he was 7.6 right. and now he's, you know, below five, 5.7. 5 he's, I think he was 5.5 .5, and he's on nothing. Okay. And he says, Oh, I stopped my blood pressure medicine. Okay. His blood pressure is 110 over 70. Is he still now, uh, some weight? Oh, oh, he lost weight, you know. And so anyway, he was just, you know, um, yeah, he's a big, <laughs> uh, let's see, well, how old was he? 42. Uh, okay, I mentioned he's uh, he's from Barbados. Big yeah. guy. Yeah, 6'2". He, um, he went from obese down to overweight all the way to, I said, you're not even... You're borderline overweight, but I don't think you're borderline overweight. I think you have months. muscle mass. Which, in five months, yeah. What? What? what yeah. And he, did you did you minimize? Because in your book, you mentioned something that might work for a lot of people. That six, seven, that eight hundred calorie, six hundred calorie diet. You know, it's, yeah. it's just enough to where you're not. You know, the fasting whores are are kept at bay. Right. Uh, but it's in, you know, it's just enough to get through life. And I'm wondering, is there amount of calories that do retain muscle? Like at 800 calories, you're still retaining muscle as long as you're pregnant. Uh, yeah. So, so I told you before about uh, some of those patients I was putting on a, a protein sparing modified fast. Yeah. And um, I, I was, I was giving men the minimal amount for men was like 70 grams and women 55. Okay. Uh, that's that's not a lot, but it was enough to spare protein. In fact, uh, measuring their their muscle mass as we were going on, you know, through the course, because sometimes I would have people on this for over a year. Wow. Okay, before I would realimentate them, you know, and start eating uh, regular food again. Was it low calorie the whole time, or you'd increase? Uh, yeah, very, very low calorie. Uh, the men, it was around. 600 um to 650 something like that okay uh, the women were a little bit less but uh they stayed on that uh they had you know all the vitamins and nutrients they needed uh, but we were able to um actually build muscles so the people that they couldn't exercise because they were so big Right. But, you know, after, you know, you drop down 100 pounds, well, now we can start <laughs> doing yeah. something. Yeah. Not that they couldn't, but uh, some people, you know, their 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 ankles were weak. There was too much weight. And, um, you know, the next thing you know, they're going to the gym, building muscle. Okay, so not losing muscle, but building muscle, mm -hmm. uh, because I could measure that in my office. And uh, that was, I was doing that back in the... Uh, late 80s i think i started in 87 doing well, that i might have interrupted you with the guy with barbados but he oh. he was uh he got down a good weight in five oh. months did he how much was he eating during that five month period okay i did not put him on keto i didn't take him off carbs i just told him how to eat carbs so 
uh, the, the principle I, I told him was that, okay, no processed carbs. You're going to eliminate all processed carbs. And he took notes and he said, yeah, okay. So uh, we're trying to get the glucose curve not to spike uh, too much, but, but to go, go in and reach all the your next eating time uh, without making fat, kind of like that. So I, I tell them the two things, the two things that you need to focus on, nutrient dense, more above ground vegetables than below ground. The above ground vegetables have lots of fiber and the fiber is going to slow down your glucose absorption. Right. Wow, it's all engineered. And the fiber is going to feed your microbiome, which is going to work in your favor for this whole weight loss thing. And to your point about juice, eating six oranges, eating an orange with the juice, the pectin, I don't know if there's pectin there, but the fiber, the content, all of that slows down the absor the, the rate, right? the orange juice, because that's how God created us. Too. Right. Really yeah. Helpful. But then we could take too much of that, okay, all at once. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. So I'm not going to eat six or eight oranges. I'm just going to have an orange and it's actually fine. I'm not going to get a spike like that. I'm going to get a curve like that. So I tell them the fiber in your food is going to slow that down and you use it as a fuel and you get those nutrients. The second thing is the protein content. You need to have protein with your meals. And if you have protein, what is it? your protein comes in with your other macros, your fats, carbs, proteins into the stomach, and the stomach is what a, a predigested pouch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does the stomach have in it? Acid. Hydrochloric acid. That's to prepare the protein. Okay. Um, the carbs and fats don't get a free pass. They have to wait. Sorry, you came in with. Protein. You're going to have to. Wait. We're going to empty slower. Oh my gosh, I eat that steak. It's just sitting on my stomach. Well, it is. Okay. And as the stomach slows down, it's emptying coming into the duodenum. Okay. That's where all the glucose is going to be absorbed, right? So if you slow down the gastric emptying, you're going to slow down the curve. And so the curve goes like that without, you know, if you had some Chinese meal with lots of noodles or whatever, and, you know, it's later you're you're, yeah. um, you know, you're having problems. So anyway, uh, those two things, the fiber, the vegetables and the protein, and we're going to just, uh, have a nice smooth curve. That's what I told the guy. Uh, he came back and he said, uh, that he says, I know you told me to go in slowly, but he says, uh, you know, it's from yeah. Barbados. Yeah. Like and, and so what would you estimate maybe around 2000 calories a day? He had me, I guess it did. Just uh, he, 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 he probably did. He says, uh, yeah, he was a good sized guy, uh, six, two. And he had a, probably about that amount. I went over his diet and it was, it's really healthy. Yeah. He would lose, he would lose. And, um, it, you know, that whole thing, I mean, protein's such a big debate. I don't want to mention doctors names, but a lot of them, you know, people follow who follow fasting and they, they, they talk about, you know, no animal products and just, uh, we don't need a lot of protein. Um, but and when you look at their physique, you can kind of tell that they're also <clears throat> very frail. And I know they're finding as we get older, especially that lean muscle mass is really, really important. And then right. you can't get the protein content that you need. Um, and I don't know why we were designed just to have plants only. Maybe the soil was different. Maybe, you know, uh, we, we, God said you can have meat after the flood. So I don't know how people made it. Maybe the environment, the, the ozone, the structure, the, 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 who knows, but I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but I thought it was funny. Yeah. No, I have. And, it, and, it, and a lot of it is just conjecture, but, um, you know, ab absolutely. Um, we were designed to eat plants, uh, but meat came along, but he also enabled us to, you know, I mean, the, the whole old Testament is full of meat eating. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And I, yeah. I got to throw this out there because I am curious your thoughts. Um, I've went back and forth <clears throat> largely because of the influence of others. Um, because when I was in the health, health and fitness industry, I was overseeing, you know, a lot of personal trainers, maybe 50, 60 of them looking at their programs. Um, I never was really certified, but I had a well-balanced knowledge on different things. But um, 
you know, the big thing was energy in, energy out. And then you, you know, recently early 2000s, um, and I can say even like Jason Fung, you know, I'm sure you followed him and, and other yeah. where they're just, uh, it doesn't matter. Calories don't matter. It's hormones. And even a friend of mine, Dr. Daniel Pompa, you know, he's got, we've talked about this before and I understand it. It is hormones because uh, a lot of it, but if you're taking in more energy than your body needs, you're going to store it. I mean, so calories, it's, it's not like you can just eat 4,000 calories and oh, hey, it doesn't, oh, calories don't yeah. matter. They actually do matter. Yeah. I, I think is that, yeah. we, you know, because if you eat too much. Yeah, absolutely. And as far as the protein goes, uh, I mean, I, I've had bodybuilders that came in and I, I had to tell them, I go, look, you're, uh, you're diabetic. And how can I be diabetic? I, I don't eat any carbs. Okay. Well, you know, it, it, to start off with, uh, okay. So you're consuming three dozen eggs. Okay. A day. Okay. Just egg whites. Okay. But three dozen eggs. And then you have two big slabs of this, meat okay and it's huge amounts you're talking uh so much protein that it was uh it, it's gluconeogenesis you're breaking it all down and you're forming glucose so uh, with um with the keto diet you know if people aren't you know they say i don't understand you know i'm down to 20 20 uh 20 grams of carbs but i can't lose any uh you know how come i'm not in ketosis well, they're either not taking in enough fat or they're taking in too much protein because the protein is going to be converted into glucose, gluconeogenesis. Yeah. And uh, so, and then you're going to end up storing it. So and, uh, interesting, most people don't do that. But as far as, you know, the, how much, as far as, uh, you know, grams per kilo or grams per pound, yeah, the, the the amount that I was telling you with the the very low calorie diet that is more like um, about point, that's about 0.8 uh, grams per kilo mm -hmm. if I recall right yeah um, but but uh, but other people will will vary on that so I I'm not fixated on one number I don't believe in uh, I don't believe in counting calories but I tell people you you may need to do that to initially just to figure out wow i really am consuming a lot wow yes. uh, maybe i should sh uh, you know shut that down and decrease my sizes but uh i i don't want them to fixate on it but i do tell them i want you to initially learn the the content if you're buying food um that has labels i go find out how many grams of carbs you're taking in every day right uh, and fats and proteins, but you don't have to keep doing that. Um, what I, I remember when I, I got to my highest about, I don't know, six, seven years ago, I was two, two 30. I'm six, two. And I was two 30. I'm like, I'm eating. I mean, I'm, I was eating pretty clean, but if you go and you write it down, like, Oh man, a cup of, a cup of cashews, that's like 800 calories. And I think what was getting me is snacks, even healthy snacks. I think right. if you start to write it down, you realize, oh, I'm, I'm like eating way too many calories. So I think it is good. I mean, the bottom line is, people, sh if they need to really lose some weight and get serious, they need to really, they need to really monitor that caloric intake and make sure it's the right foods. You know, right. that we're talking about. Right, and uh, so I, I, I do have patients. Uh, you know, after when I first meet them and I go over this, I say, you're going to keep a diary until I see you again. Okay. And you're going to tell me. You're going to tell me how much you eat, what time you eat, um, and uh, yeah, let's see, uh, what you eat, how much you eat, what time you eat, what time you go to bed, what time you wake up, and that kind of gives me a little something to go with. Uh, it's a springboard, so I can discuss, wow, did you know that you could substitute this for that, and why are you eating a snack? Why do you need a snack? Is it out of boredom, or are you actually hungry? And okay, well, the boredom, that's, that's, that's another issue dealing with that, right. but if you're eating nutrient dense foods and you have plenty of the, uh, vegetables with fiber. Um, it should carry you through the more, uh, the, the higher, the amount of, uh, nutrients, for food, okay. For calories, 
All right. Now we're going to uh, delve into some a few more important topics. Again, I'm here with Dr. Paul Brillhart. You can find his book on Amazon.com, The Lost Art of Fasting in a Gluttonous World. And I know people have a lot of questions for you, but I think the the book will answer you know a lot of those questions. Right. Um, and I don't know if we've touched on a lot. Yeah. I don't, go ahead. You want to enter? enter. Yeah, the uh, the other way <clears throat> is through my. Uh, my site, Dr. Oh yes, Dr. Paul Brillhart.com, and that should link to the page at the uh, store. Dr. Paul Brillhart, and I think they can see our names on 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 this recording. It'll be in the the title. We might even be able to put in YouTube uh, in the description. And again, uh, Dr. Paul is not does not have an open practice. Um, so as much as I'd like him to take me on too, I know it's his, his, his client list is already full. Uh, but you know, a lot of so much information. If you go back and you listen to what we've been talking about, and I don't know if you had any additional thoughts, you know, kind of on your mind when we when we went through, uh, you know, we we talked about what diet is best. Obviously, getting clean, a whole foods, clean meat, clean dairy. I mean. It's kind of hard, but even raw dairy to me is is ideal because the pasteurization process kills a lot of enzymes and a lot of important nutrients. But I don't know if that's practical for any. But it, maybe on that note, what would you say? You know, watch your calories, whole whole foods, get active. Uh, but what what do you do with dairy? That's always been my my tough one. If I can't find raw because um, you know organic, yeah. good, but it's. You're just drinking a lot of lactose. You're drinking a lot of sugar water. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. No, with the uh, with the dairy. Well, gee, are you are you drinking milk? Or are you eating cheese? Or are you doing both. other um, yeah both. yogurt or kefir? Um, so uh, absolutely, you need to go organic. That's an absolute. As far as going raw, yeah, that's not practical for most people. Yeah, I wish it was. I don't have a farm. Yeah, and then. Uh, you know, you get into, uh, you know, problems with the authorities. I mean, they try to, uh, they do, they'll try to shut a lot of those operations down, but, um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's another topic in and of itself. But I try to, um, I, I tell people everything in moderation, um, cause there are people that will say absolutely no dairy, no dairy. Yeah. Uh, and it works and, good. It works good for some people, you know, do it better yeah. works for you. Yeah. And so I, with that because like what i said is the peoples around the world that have been you know they're they've been living off of dairy their whole, whole life and even some of these uh centenarians okay well they're having some dairy protein in there as well uh, they're eating cheeses and kefirs and yogurts and things um but you know all of those diets vary quite a bit but it's a very interesting topic um yeah that um i i try to uh, moderation in all and my gosh um you just feed the body that you you put the vehicle uh you put the vehicle in the um you, know, you drive into the gas station and you're going to put good fuel in uh you're not going to just say ah put whatever in okay well no uh this is this vehicle only runs on, on super unleaded oh uh, by the way don't use the diesel okay ah no nah, no it's okay whatever fuel it doesn't matter yeah uh, so i try to just focus in on doing away with all the fake food try to get yeah whole foods, uh, nutrients uh, uh, and then i try to get them uh, to change their thinking about how they eat and i don't I, I tell them don't be rigid if you're rigid you break okay be flexible yeah and uh, if you want to change lanes you, know, you go from the carb lane to the fat lane or back or if you want to take a break off the side of the road for a while get back on the highway and go yeah but think of this as a, a diet it's a lifestyle yeah. so again i tell i tell my patients that you uh, I, i'm a driving instructor i give driving lessons and this is it i teach you how your vehicle operates this is what it is so if you stay with the basics stay with the uh in the lane yeah Okay, nutrient dense foods. So, um, and you mentioned a word, a word, a centurion, right? Those who have made it centenarian, centenarian, yeah, they've made it to 100 years old. And I don't know if I, I think I sent you the video, but um, uh, I correspond sometimes with Gary Brecca, 
Yeah. Uh, he used to be in the insurance industry and he, you know, they, they used to be able to pinpoint. He said something that on their study of these people who are a hundred, every single one of them had high cholesterol. Uh, yeah, I know that that's true. And uh, yeah, I, I mentioned that to someone yesterday. I said, well, you know that the centenarians don't have low cholesterol. Yeah. And, well, d- really? Yeah, that's right. So is it all about cholesterol? No, it's not all about cholesterol. Cholesterol, as we mentioned, is one of the most important molecules. In the body, yeah, controls but, so much. Yeah, and so uh, why do we want to suppress that? But here from, you know, uh, when people are having uh, events or heart attacks, they're just, uh, the cardiologists are telling them, well, we need to lower it more. We need to lower it more. And they're getting so low that you end up getting that J curve and you end up having increased morbidity or mortality. And, and this could just be me, you know, I, I, I don't know if there's much to back it, but there's so many hormonal hormone problems right now, right? Right. And so I'm thinking if we're really watching cholesterol and minimizing cholesterol, yet cholesterol is one of the main um, triggers to adequately adjust progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, growth hormone. I mean, how many hormones do we have? I don't even know. 50, 60? I don't know. There's a lot. Yeah. There's there's a few. So cholesterol is actually designed to help us balance hormones. So if we're minimizing cholesterol, especially if you're on statins, man, that could really... Right. So uh, just for those out there um i mean we have the the cholesterol molecule to start with that's our our chassis yeah and then we convert it into pregnant alone oh the mother hormone yeah okay and then it goes to dhea and it comes over here to progesterone and cortisol and you have the uh you know the the male hormones and then it goes into the female hormones right so we have we have so many of these but it requires the cholesterol they're called steroid hormones because they are sterile like humanoids like human. Okay. Steroids are like sterile. What is sterile? Cholesterol. Right. Cholesterol. Oh, that's a good. And when a doctor, when people say, Oh, the doctor put me on steroids. A lot of people think they're, they're talking about the type of steroids you just talked about. They're not talking about anabolic androgenic, which means anabolic growth, androgenic male hormone type, you know, the, right. those are different type of 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 steroid but it actually leads me into what i'm the point i'm trying to get out all this push for you know you hear hrt trt steroids and maybe we should let the listener know hrt is hormone replacement therapy which can be male male or female estrogen progesterone on the female testosterone human growth hormone well i guess women that too if they would need that but then you have then you have TRT, which is testosterone replacement therapy. Men are seeing a decrease in testosterone, and then you have steroids, which would be they're taking um, they're taking testosterone on their own, maybe from a doctor. They're also taking like anabol, anavar, or anadrol, dianabol. They're taking some growth hormone. So steroids, when somebody's on steroids, they're just overcompensate. They're just taking way too much, and I think that'd be a good way to break it down for the listeners so they understand but i think the the thing a lot of what's going on with hormones and this i'm leading in the, then i'll just give you the microphone is cholesterol yes but also what do they call those endocrine disruptors yes endocrine disruptors. disrupting chemicals so yeah, and eating, we're seeing that in our hair eating. products deodorant <clears throat> so i think that's why i like you do functional medicine because so many people are going to the doctor give me trt but if you're getting enough sleep, I mean, I'm sure firemen have low testosterone because of that, right? Sleep, yeah, absolutely. proper diet. So maybe you can unpack that whole topic. And oh, I'll my God. Okay, that. so, um, <laughs> yeah. In under so, five minutes, right? Okay, so uh, no yeah. where do I jump into there? Okay, men, okay, hormones, okay, uh, testosterone counts, uh, sperm counts. So uh, back when, I, you know, 40-something years ago, okay, when I first – came into this the the ranges for sperm counts were like this okay okay down here uh this is bordering infertility okay so in the 1980s 
This is this is in the sep. Uh, is, this is in the, yeah. This would have been 1980 thereabouts. Okay. okay. So um, below this, this is infertility. Okay. So now our new norm is this. Oh wow. Okay. So uh, wow. Our our range. Well, I thought this was infertility before. Well, no, that's now the new norm. So our fertility has dropped off tremendously. So that is due to some of the things you mentioned yeah. with the endocrine disrupting chemicals. So if, if people want to look that up, I mean, they can go to the endocrine society and uh, uh, look at some of the studies or some of the list. Uh, there's so many chemicals out there. Uh, for instance, endocrine, what is the endocrine system? That's actually the hormonal system. Okay, that is, that is the hormonal system. Um, uh, adrenal glands. So, so all of, yeah, from your hypothalamus to your pituitary to your thyroid to your adrenals to your gonads. Okay. Um, all of those are uh, part of the endocrine system. Okay. And so you see an endocrinologist because of an endocrine problem. So, um, the endocrine disrupting chemicals disrupt the normal. Uh, um, well, yeah the normal flow of the hormones and their effect. So anyway, we've had a drop off in men's testosterone uh, to a degree. Um, other things in our foods, um, oh, what is it? Sodium, aluminum, is it phosphate? It, it shows up in al almost every baked food. It's kind of one of these, um, I don't know whether it's an anti-caking agent or something, but it's, it's in most. Like emul of, emulsifiers, uh, emulsifiers, or uh, I don't know. It's an emulsifier, but it's it's one of those food ingredients. I'm sorry, I Argena, Caragena. I, I I don't remember exactly, but it's found in a lot of those foods. But it's an aluminum product, but okay, it drops sperm counts and it drops um, uh, hormone levels, and so um, we're, we're seeing that in men. You mentioned. Um, you know, uh, occupational risk, like a firefighter. Well, uh, they have disrupted sleep and sleep is so important for mm -hmm. natural hormone production. So I probably have more firefighters that I see for low T than anyone. Wow. Okay. It's, it's almost, okay. They don't have any problem for the first three years or so. And then all of a sudden they start noticing it. And uh, these guys really, I mean, they're young, they're healthy, they're working out, and yet they're starting to drop off. Mm -hmm. And I try to, uh, I try to use diet and exercise to optimize testosterone. And you, you know about this. And I mean, you can, you can triple some guy's testosterone just by doing this if everything is working right. But um, men will have a drop off starting after about age 30 they they really peak with their testosterone not when they're a teenager and they're 20. Yeah. yeah 20 25 something like that and you really don't drop off until after 30. but when uh, you know i hear from some of these men's clinics at least the patients tell me uh, they said they're going to make my testosterone that of a 16 year old and i said well a 16 year old doesn't have that high uh, believe it or not, it's actually <laughs> later. Right. And um, but this is what they're telling guys, and they're saying everyone has levels up here. Well, those are out of range. And if you you really look at the the average ranges, um, they're much much lower. Now, again, all that said, you know we have problems with endocrine disrupting chemicals. We have other things impairing our testosterone. Uh, but, um, and while you're, while you're thinking there too, I think this is an important point on testosterone. <clears throat> when you go get the injection, right. And some doctors recommend sipinate, ethanate, uh, propionate, and those are all, they all have different esters. So they're going to maybe stay in the body longer testosterone suspension, which is water-based, but these are synthetic. So your normal, your testicles are basically going to shut down. There's n it's going to eventually stop producing your testosterone now you're relying on the synthetic testosterone which in my opinion it's harder for the body to regulate and that's why you'll see emotional highs and lows you know angry mood swings uh it, it's so many things can can 
can can come in. So you, my point was, you got to be very careful and make sure you're doing it for the right reasons as a last resort. Because so many guys right. do want to they want to just they want to get bigger too. They think, oh, I can take steroids. Oh. Now, you know. Well, well, that's uh, where most of these. Uh, <laughs> these guys are aiming and they're uh, listening to some of the men's clinics out there that are telling them this. And uh, it's really not true. I'm all into balancing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, having, <laughs> having low, t- no fun. And no, these guys, they have, they have no energy. They're dragging. Uh, they're irritable and moody. They got the grumpy old man syndrome. Yeah. Um, they're depressed. Uh, I, I've had guys coming in, after they've been treated with four or five antidepressants, it wasn't, none of those worked. Right. And when I moved their, t- their tea up, okay. All of a sudden they, they lit up and they're going, Oh my gosh, I feel normal. Mm-hmm. Um, do so in most cases you would recommend it. You know, I, I probably would to a fireman who needs to have his job and you know, that, that's what it's there for. <clears throat> right. But is there other, <clears throat> do you try, <clears throat> let's say they're there. Can, can they make up that sleep at four days a week? And begin to change their diet and lose some weight, or is that is is it's it's very difficult with their schedule. You, yeah, it is. Yeah. You end up getting disrupted sleep more and more. Now, uh, I've treated many of them after they retired. Okay, they still have some issues, but they don't have the same issue. Got it. Uh, but again, at that age, I mean, they're they're retired. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but again, many of them retire young from the fire service. But uh, any, anyway, um, that's that's kind of a subset out there. But most uh, most guys out there, it's due to their diet. It's due to uh, eating stress. improperly. Stress, mm-hmm. stress too. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, again, the the stress releases uh, cortisol, another steroid hormone, and uh, that uh, causes you to gain weight. And it uh, causes problems with the uh, brain uh, and the function up there. It affects your your uh, hippocampus. And uh, uh, anyway, it gets back to diet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so I try to change that as much as I can. If I can't, okay, then we can look into other ways of going about it. Uh, the, the different forms of testosterone replacement would include uh, injections, as you mentioned, pellets, um, and the pellets right. are injected into or placed into the glute and they're on time release. Right. And you know, you move it after six months, but you have to dial it in and you have to make sure you get the right because well, you don't take it out. Okay. No. It's gonna yeah. be there. So if you overshoot, um, I had a guy I measured him. He's actually in the fire service. <laughs> yeah. And he uh, I measured his testosterone after at six months post last pellet 3000. Oh. Okay. So, uh, okay. So oh. if you, if you're going over a thousand, that's, you know, that's actually out the, uh, the more yeah. than two standard deviations from the average. And are we looking at free testosterone, the amount the testosterone that's active, or do you look at both? Reading? I look at, I always look at both. But his his total was uh, it, it was so high it was like almost you know it was three thousand and that was at six months and he was shocked and I said do you know what that means and he goes yeah they, yeah they they screwed up yeah and, but did he they, have mood swings or anything from that level uh, of- well yeah he was you know he he wanted me to take over his care because he says something's not right well that yeah that, yeah no kidding wow. So, so anyway, uh, you can get into trouble with the pellets. I mean, uh, I mean, they, it's basically a, a money maker. That's why they do it. Okay. Yeah. So, and it's a convenience, so you don't have to worry about anything and you get a steady state. Well, yeah, theoretically it's, a, it's a great idea. It's not practical for everyone. Uh, maybe they can't afford it. Insurance isn't going to pick that up. The, uh, the testosterone injections, uh, say for instance, like sipionate, well, uh, you get a you get a peak and then you get a trough and you get a peak and a trough. So you get this sawtooth type mm-hmm. uh, curve. So I don't like the peaks. If they go too high, they become irritable and moody. And you know, this is where you get, you know, well, uh it can affect your moods. Okay. Uh so if you get a nice steady state. 
uh, there's usually not a problem. And but, your body, that's what your body does naturally, right? Right. Ideally. Your, 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 your testosterone is going to be kind of steady. I mean, it, it peaks in the morning and then goes drops off throughout the day right but, but these guys are having really highs and lows and then the, the problem with the highs with the injections you're going to get red blood cell hyperplasia or overgrowth of red blood cells so your blood is getting thicker and uh that's not necessarily a good thing and so right. th those guys i would say well you're going to have to if you're getting out there and we can't avoid it you're going to have to donate blood uh and uh, just to get rid of it yeah. Drop the hemoglobin hematocrit uh, down to a reasonable range. And so they might do that every eight weeks, but I, that's not my ideal. No. Uh, as they get down to the lows, then they're feeling, you know, really yucky. Now, I, I have guys that, you know, they don't have any change. They feel fine here or here. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in that window. But other guys, they can't handle those peaks. So I, I shorten, I lower the dose, I shorten the free, the um, interval, and uh, and so they have smaller uh, sawtooth. So for the listener, it wouldn't be 100 milligrams of sipinate a week. It would be 20 milligrams maybe every other day. You know that way you're breaking up. Uh, that's that's one way of doing it. Now a lot of guys say, "Oh, I don't want to do that." Okay, that's yeah. true. Every, okay. Shot every other day. It's not okay, fun. Uh, and then they're. There are some people that have gone on to doing uh, uh, subcutaneous. Okay, well, well, you can't do that. Well, people are doing it. Uh, I haven't seen any studies going into the going into that, but there are uh, other products that have come out more recently that um, do uh, subcutaneous. Uh, test. I think it's enthanate that they're using testosterone enthanate, but it's a it's a once weekly. And it basically gives a more of a steady state. Um, is it, is it, I mean, on the uh, what do you mean subcutaneous? Okay, so like if you're injecting insulin, that's subcutaneous. If oh, you're, it's right in your ab. Yeah. If you're injecting uh, testosterone sipionate, you're going to be going intramuscular. So awesome. you're going to you're going to be going in big you know, big needle, inch, yeah. inch and a half. Okay. And just so, a, just this probably won't apply to most people, but I'm just curious, real quick, what was the point of Sustanon 250 with the combination of all three, ethanate, propionate, and sipinate? I don't know if you've heard of that before. Um, uh, yeah, but I can't comment as an authority okay. on that. I, I okay. don't know. Um, uh, it just it just hit my. So to give the guy some practical examples, endocrine disruptors. Make sure your shaving cream, your even women. Uh, your shampoo, conditioner, all, because your skin is an organ and it absorbs and all the, the aluminum. If you're putting deodorant on a couple times a day, wow. what we're putting on our skin, that's really the endocrine disruptors. Yeah. Also, I mean, isn't glyphosate um, plays a role in that in, in Roundup and, and pesticides? That's that's, that's a nasty chemical. Uh, yeah. there, is, there isn't any safe level of glyphosate for the human body and yet it's being found in all the, the gmo foods yeah. uh well they're roundup resistant and so uh you have companies like quaker oats they went to roundup oats wow and just so people know again they uh gmo genetically modified organism so they have uh, a friend of mine actually has a phd in this and, and does gene splicing and uh, works for Monsanto, believe it or not. And so they, but he, he did it for a good reason, trying to get food down in Columbia and different, you know, trying to drought resistant areas. But um, so what they do is they'll actually splice the genes so you can spray Roundup pesticides on your wheat and it won't kill the wheat. It will kill the, the weeds around it because the, right. the wheat has been genetically modified to be exactly. resistant to round up, round up ready. So, so it's just. So, so, so the, the residue is ending up on yeah. the plant and it doesn't yes. all come off. No. And so uh, I remember in 2018, you know, seeing the report, Oh, wow. Uh, a, a test on uh, Quaker Oats. Okay. And you know, the old fashioned. Yeah. Uh, big bottles that come like that um high level 
and uh, they they had uh, you know a fair amount of glyphosate found detected in there. Well, there is no safe level of glyphosate, and it causes cancer. It causes a lot of things. Uh, it's like like well, how much uh, how much mercury or arsenic or what if you if you knew that was in there? Well, well, it's just a little bit of arsenic. You know that won't hurt me. Right. So so anyway, it's it's really not good, and we get into those. Uh, uh, and the, the, the very bad effects on our hormones too. But with regards to the testosterone, getting back to that, as far as the other forms, uh, there are topical forms. There's gels and there's creams and patches. Um, those actually do give you a steady state, but you do have to put them on every day. Uh, the patch, yeah, again, every day. It's um, it not always desirable because you get these red blotches all over your body every time you change it um the uh topical creams or gels they can be transferable to other people if you have you know small children uh you know if they're in contact you sure, can yeah. rub that off um generally speaking if someone is cognizant aware of that they uh, and they avoid you know contact they're really not going to transfer it much but you do have to when you put it on you're going to have to wash your hands really good make sure uh, that skin isn't exposed to anyone else but that's that is a way you you'll get a steady state after about um seven days roughly uh i was gonna mention what about i know there's gonna be a lot of women listening on uh menopause hormone yeah. replacement therapy um what would you say is a percentage of women who don't need hormone replacement therapy who are actually taking it if they would you know change diet maybe ideal body weight. There's a lot of things that can, you know, I, I think my problem is yeah. even with myself as I get older is sometimes we want to run to this therapy, but neglect a lot of the primary causes. Right. Yeah. So with myself, I, um, I monitor my, my T levels. Okay. Uh, I look at those and I may not have as much as I had years ago, but I, I really haven't dropped off that much. Okay. And I'm just making sure it's not going to drop off and I'm doing everything I can. But um, when I started being very mindful of, of my diet and all the other factors that influence it and eliminating things that will drop it, I, uh, you know, I saw it come up and, and it, uh, it stayed up. So that's a good thing with women uh yeah i try to optimize their diet it's it, it, hrt is a life issue because there are women everyone is different uh there are women that say 10 percent they don't get any hot flashes or sweat so they uh, they say i don't know what the what the deal is right when i ask uh, when i ask uh you know people in the field you know uh, medicine you know well what's menopause oh well that's uh, they go through this period where they have hot flashes well, okay, well, what if she never had hot flashes? Does that mean she didn't go through menopause? Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, she, she went through menopause. Well, how do you know? Well, what's, what's the definition? The definition is cessation of ovarian function and, and production of hormones. Okay. So they drop off. Okay, some women get vasomotor symptoms. Uh, some don't. And some, they continue even, you know, 10, 15 years wow. later. Wow. They're still getting... Well, wait a minute. That can't be. No, they still are. I have, I've had patients, many of them, that have told me about their hot flashes still existing. So, uh, for all these women in the middle, okay, every woman is different. Okay, they're going to uh, experience maybe depression or anxiety. It peaks. It really goes up high in the perimenopause and the menopausal uh, beginning, okay, but it doesn't drop off that much after things settle a little bit. Okay, so things will settle and, if they ride it out. Yeah, and things things will settle out a little bit, but uh, there's, there's cognitive functioning issues, okay? Um, they may not be able to focus, concentrate, uh, multitask, okay. uh, and so... For a lot of them, that's devastating, and um, they they see the other changes. I mean, they come in and they're going, "Wow, why do I have all these uh, aches?" You know, I think I have arth uh, arthritis, and my my other doctor told me I have arthritis because this came on, and 
uh, you know, I'm bringing up the hormone levels a little bit, all of a sudden the arthritis disappears. Well, it wasn't wow. due to so, um, yeah, it wasn't osteoarthritis, especially the, the clue is that all of a sudden it came out of nowhere. Okay. And I've been having it for six months. Well, okay. And then they say they're 51, 52 years of age. There's a clue there. Um, but it's a quality of life issue. So they will, they will lose their uh, skin thickness. Their skin becomes dry, becomes itchy. Um, they, they, no longer have uh, lubrication. They become dry down below. They have urinary problems. Uh, they can't hold their urine. Um, uh, their hormones are dropping off. Women will drop off fifty uh, percent testosterone production. Usually, I mean, the other half comes from the adrenals. So, do, um, do, do some women get on testosterone therapy then too? And estrogen it just depends what they're. Uh, yes, yes, but I don't. I don't put uh, I don't put all women on testosterone. There are some women. I mean, I can't even let them smell this stuff. I mean, they just they really react. Yeah. And other women, I give them a little bit, and they're asking me for, can I have twice as much? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it makes all the difference in the world, and they feel like they have their life back. But. Uh, every woman is different, and so I just say, I don't know what your template is. We're going to have to figure it out. And it's a little bit of trial and error. It's not one size fits all. And really? you, you see the pharmaceutical industry has the model of uh, there's small and large. Right. Yeah. That's what we're, you know, it's one or the other. Yeah. And they never take lifestyle into consideration. You know, they'll never. Uh, well, no. Uh, and no, none of uh, none of my colleagues are, are educated on that. And so, because it's not taught to us. What would you recommend then for women before they jump right into to hormone replacement therapy? I mean, look, I mean, I mean, maybe increasing protein, a lot less sugar, a lot less carbohydrates. Oh, if, if you get them off their sugar addiction and you get them off their high carbohydrates, especially processed carbs, Huge. everything changes. Yeah. Everything changes. And your body is able to kind of heal, but the high sugar content that just that weakens your immune system and it drives inflammation. And that's behind most all of our processes. So, um, oh my gosh, even the intermittent fasting, I mean, you, you end up having, you know, we mentioned about growth hormone, you know, after you do a, a little thing, well, that's men and women. Okay. And, you know, by the age of, by the age of 60, uh, our growth hormone is down to almost nothing. Okay. But it's gee, it's amazing where you can, you know, increase that. You can change growth hormone. You can increase that by doing intermittent fasting or, um, you're familiar with this also. I mean, doing brief hit workouts. Okay. Uh, so you get the, you know, the nitric oxide release stimulating mitochondria, but it also, stimulates testosterone and growth hormone. Wow. And so people what they hit, hit is high intensity interval training. So you're you're doing things at a pretty high, I mean, a good it's it's you're such a rate where you can't really talk and have a conversation is way is what I tell people. It's it's, you know, get on the bike, do a two minute interval, some push-ups, some I mean you're keeping that heart rate high. It's high intensity interval and that causes the body to to increase all those areas. But I but I want to distinguish between uh a high high intensity interval training in a short brief period or a class for 30, 40 oh, minutes. Yeah. Okay. Please I'm not, do. yeah. I'm not talking about that because, uh, in the studies going back several years, I think it was Dr. Bush. I don't remember his first name, but anyway, Dr. Bush did some of this work and he was looking at this, um, doing, um, three to five minutes. Okay. If you go past, if you go past 10 minutes, you definitely get a washout effect. Yeah. They didn't see these effects that I just mentioned with the nitric oxide. Um, the nitric oxide hanging around for just a short time, it's concentrated, it's in your muscles, mm -hmm. and it's, it's not really dissipating yet. But if you keep working out, that dissipates and you will lose this effect. Okay, if you want to get big, you're going to have to work out you know, with heavier weights and for longer, okay. Right. Or you're going to need to run a distance if you want to build up endurance. But for this brief thing, this is large muscle groups. Okay. Um, 
rapidly activated for brevity, short period of time. So uh, some people refer to it as the nitric oxide dump. Okay, so the, the nitric oxide has time. And if you do that, uh, say two, three times a day, uh, you get this, you get more bang for your buck if you're, if you're doing the resistance workout or the uh, cardio workout. Okay, you're going to get more effect from your muscles because mm. of that. Okay, so uh, I, I know a lot of trainers that incorporate this to get more response from their clientele. Okay, but I, uh, you know, I I've been teaching this to you know 75 year old ladies for uh, the last 15 years at least. Okay, and telling them as you get older, you have to work out smarter, not harder. Okay. Mm. Um, and you know about blood flow resistance bands, right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and I mean, people out there listening may not know what those are. You can explain, but, uh, but when you're using those, you're getting a similar effect. You're actually holding on to that nitric oxide. Okay. They're, they're, they're compressing the area. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the bands are, uh, you, you can use them on your extremities. Okay. You can't use it. On no, your neck. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not a tourniquet it's just it's it's down the flow and it's while you're working out but you can you can lift uh not the super high weight all you have to do is you know go say uh, three quarters of uh, your max and you will get the same benefit and you won't have the risk of tearing the muscle fiber in the same way that's what I'm telling for practical examples. People could just do some squats at home or some tricep movements or some bicep movements or even not push-ups, but go go down your knees, maybe half push-ups. I mean, you can, there's a lot of things you can do to be strategic about, you know, moving. Yeah. Uh, patients, look, you don't have to go to the gym to do this real quickly. Uh, oh. Look, um, I, I tell them first thing in the morning. Okay. Um, I do this every morning. I put on a podcast Mm -hmm. uh, and I will, I will do like five minutes. I might do, uh, I might do two minutes of pushups and then I, I come up with maybe, uh, I, I probably have three dozen different exercises I can do. They're, they're nothing more than calisthenics if you think about it. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was telling this to a, um, oh, a Pilates instructor and she says, oh, my gosh, those are Pilates moves, you know, and she says, I, I know all those. And I said, well, this is how I want you to do them. And uh, it, it does make a really big difference. Uh, and it, it gets people going, you know, first thing in the morning. OK, it only takes only takes five minutes. Yeah, um, I might, sometimes I might do one, but I, I try to keep it down. Key is to keep moving um, to kind of wind down here a little bit. Um, I know there's some topics that are so important. Each of these would take a, a podcast again on their on their own, but maybe I can just hit you with a few quick things that people are interested in. Just maybe yes, it works. No, it doesn't. And maybe a few quick thoughts on it. Um, All right. What What about the big craze right now with uh, hydrogen water? You know, it seems to make sense. Uh, they're allowing hydrogen to go into their water before drinking it. I've been seeing a lot of. I, yeah, I've. I've looked at that. I've read a little bit on it. Um, still up for discussion. I, I'm not. Yeah, it's still up for discussion. I someone asked me about something else the other day, and they said, "Oh, that's a bunch of rubbish." And I go, "Sounds like rubbish, doesn't it?" I go, "But I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna close because I actually need to look at that." Yeah, that's right. Uh, and so, yeah, and so I'm still looking at that myself. Um, but I do understand the, the, you know, the principle behind it. We just don't know if it's, uh, and, will, the, will the will the hydrogen stay in the water enough to affect the cells in your body? You know, that's my question. You know, but well, the, the body that, that's this whole thing is the body the body has great um, uh, adaptive systems in it to, uh, for instance, you know, people taking alkaline water. I go, well, you know, uh, you, you immediately put it in, you immediately put they, someone told me uh, last week. They go, I took alkaline water, and all of a sudden, my 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 acid reflux was better. 
And I said, well, it's like taking an antacid. I said, you, I said, do you realize that was, um, let's see, it wasn't uh, sodium bicarbonate. They were using potassium bicarbonate, okay, that's put in the alkaline water. And I said, it's bicarb. And it's a, it just buffered your acid in your stomach and all of a sudden, okay. But uh, I don't address acid reflux disease. That way, yeah. You know, just giving antacids, okay. It's but I said, problem. that's what you did and that's why. I said, but your body, I said, so you just neutralized all that, that alkaline. You, uh, your body's going to make some more acid right after that. But, uh, you know, people say, well, I, I, I need to eat more, uh, you know, alkaline and this is for my, for cancer or whatever. Well, a lot of the foods that are alkaline, they end up being acidic, but as soon as they touch when them, they, it's yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, they're going to be, um, they, they actually turn into acid molecules in the whole process of the digestion. So what you thought you were putting into your body as a alkaline substance really isn't. And again, once it gets into your bloodstream, your buffering system takes over as long as everything is healthy. Right. So that and, was the next question. We don't, I wouldn't, I don't worry too much about uh, uh, pH water, pH level in the water. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, 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 I don't, I, <laughs> It doesn't make sense to me, okay, as far as uh, the the physiology involved and right. w why they're saying it. I'm thinking a lot of these people, that, um, I don't think they have a background in this to actually make that judgment. Yeah, true. Okay. Okay. What, what tell, about, me, tell me the studies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and just real quick, cold water plunge. Ah. It's, you know. Okay. I, I, have, a, I have a pool. Uh, okay. It's uh, currently it's currently about fifty I've degrees. I've tried it and it feels good, but it's it's not too easy. I don't okay, know. Okay, so I, I know I know you're you're probably well versed on Wim Hof and that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so anyway, my 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 son and I uh, some time back, you know, we were talking about this, and so uh, we decided, okay, let's start doing it. So I mean, a couple months ago, yeah, it was it actually went down to twenty eight degrees in my pool. Okay. And it's the what I have the water flowing. It's wow. still going. Wow. And so you you get in is 28. That's below freezing. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty stinking cold. And uh, I, I will say that's hard. But uh, it has tremendous effects on uh, decreasing inflammation. Your body, your body reacts to extreme. So if you go into extreme cold or extreme heat, it has these incredible adaptive things and you come out better so now, fasting is an extreme fasting is getting your body out of a comfort zone <laughs> yeah out of the comfort zone so the idea of going into a freezing pool it's really hard but you you, you know that it's just going to be mainly the first 30 seconds yeah that are hard and um, <laughs> i'm glad you brought that up because with wim hof or anybody else what, what's really helped me a lot over the years is Okay, these guys, there's some good information, but they're not believers. They're not grounded in God's word. They're talking about evolution, this doc. It's like, okay, biblically speaking, and I, I mean, the Bible answers food intake, exercise. A lot of these things can be answered even biblically, you know, and I would say, yeah, we're, we need to be exposed to cold and hot environments because that's how we're, we were created. Um, so okay. I, I don't really have a problem with that. I just think, you know, uh, it's, it's not okay. a problem, you know. Yeah. No, it's not a cure all, but what my son and I noticed, cause we'd go out for a, uh, we, we do a hard workout. Uh, oh, he, he's a certified trainer, by the way. Yeah. 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 I remember that. <laughs> yeah. But he, uh, you know, we, we would do a hard workout, you know, he was doing something else. I was doing something. And then we go for a, uh, you know, a long run and we come back and we go into the pool. Okay. So after doing this a little bit, I told him, I said, um, Hey, uh, have you noticed that you have less uh, inflammation post workout oh. and he says absolutely he says yeah I, i've noticed yeah. that and he said you're you, you're noticing it too and i go yeah i go this is pretty amazing and then i you know i thought about you know all those pictures of these athletes that are sitting in a you know a big tank of ice cubes okay that's why okay it totally down regulates that inflammatory response but in a good way yeah. Okay. And so that's why they, they, you know, they were, the researchers were wanting to investigate um, and use Wim Hof himself 
as the guinea pig. Let's see what your body does. No, and, it's pretty amazing what you can do. I mean, it's well, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, and yeah. I I don't want to I don't want to climb. Uh, not ever so much shorts. I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to climb the mountain snowing in shorts, and uh, I don't want to do that. And I don't want to jump into a mountain stream. It's a. It's, yeah. Are you? Are you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. You're oh, good. Okay. You, Okay, you froze up there. So uh, it's it's kind of extreme. So but anyway, somebody technically they could take a cold shower, you know, try. Uh, yeah, shower. yeah, and that's the other thing that people are encouraging. Yeah, just do a cold shower. It doesn't sound great because we like you know our nice warm showers, but uh, you can get used to it, and it actually has health benefits. Now, I don't do it. I definitely don't do that every day, yeah. uh, but I might. I might do that. Uh, two or three times a week. And, and uh, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And, you know, even, you know, my son, you know, I mean, back when it was like 32 degrees in the pool, you know, he says, I'm going out there. I thought, oh, I said, oh, um, you're coming, you're coming down with something. He goes, yeah, I felt like I was coming down with something. So I'm going to rev my immune system up. So wow. oh, don't go out in the pool, you know, uh, stay warm. Okay. Well, anyway, he, you know, he went out there for two, three days in a row. And I mean, everything was gone. He says, yeah. So he's oh, yeah, only that whole, that whole don't go out in the cold, you'll get sick is just, I mean, well, I think that's been well, disproven. Yeah, but everyone still believes it. So, I hear that you, know, a lot. you know, we only do, we only do five minutes. Yeah. Uh, we're not doing longer than that. What's funny, they'll go, oh, I can't go out in the cold. I don't want to get sick. Well, you, you're going through McDonald's every day. Uh, you might want to watch that a little, <laughs> bit, a little bit closer than uh, yes or no, red light therapy. Ah, yeah. Like uh, so, uh, okay. So there's different types of um, like uh, infrared saunas. Yeah. Okay. So uh, near infrared, good. Okay. Far infrared, I don't know that it does that much. Yeah, true. Because you're okay. not, it's not close. Okay. To so, so far infrared, it's going to penetrate, you know, about this deep, um, in your, under your skin, maybe just okay. a little bit. Okay. It doesn't really, it goes down a few millimeters, but if you go into, uh, the near and mm -hmm. going to go down inches. Wow. And what is the, what does that do? It, uh, that, that near infrared is going to stimulate your melatonin production. Where? Mitochondria. On the cells. Most of your melatonin is inside your mitochondria. Wow. And a lot of different roles, but wow. So uh, that's a good thing for your mitochondria. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, the near infrared, yeah. I, I, it's on my it's on my list of things to do. Uh, yeah, that I, I've looked at it's just the cost for most of us, you know. Well, it's not, well, my 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 son and I were we're going to build one, and we have everything. Oh, we yeah. just haven't had the time. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, you, you can make make well, one of these yourself. Well, as one of our closing thoughts, what would be your top? Because um, supplements is a whole new. I mean, we could talk about you know coenzymes we could talk about you know the vitamin e's and k's okay. and d's and multivitamin mineral uh glutamine uh you know we could just creatine i mean it's, some of it seems overkill it is it, but what would you you know I, well i think we all agree that like we're like you looked at my blood work my vitamin d seemed low so it'd be good to get a vitamin d supplement out and get a little bit of sun you know, a good multivitamin mineral, the zinc, the, you know, the, the, the key ingredients there, anything beyond that? Right. Um, the, the, you, you mentioned the D and the D is, is, is very important, but you know, we can't make it during the winter and, and it has to be the right time of day and the angle of the sun. Um, but you can make 10, 20,000 units in a half hour. Okay. It, the, the body stops though. It doesn't keep making oh, it. It's okay. kind of, it's yeah. just, it's what you need, but um, you know the the recommended daily allowance is what uh, four hundred for kids, six hundred for adults, or okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, it used to be two hundred, four hundred, and they moved it up a couple hundred. But but again, uh, you know, I have people on. You know, they they've been taking two thousand units a day, 
and uh, they're taking it with food and it's a reputable brand yep. and they're not getting their level up uh, above uh, 20. Okay, well, what's going on there? Absorption? Uh, uh, yeah. Well, uh, absorption po potentially, but like I said, they're taking it with a meal, they're, uh, they're doing everything right, but uh, some people need more, okay? It, it doesn't always work that way. Oh, so uh, I, I may have to move it up. But during the summer, um, the only thing different between my my routine in the winter and summer, in the, in the winter, I'm indoors every day, right. okay? And even on the weekends, well, I can't make D on the weekends, so I'm going to keep my D going. Uh, during the summer, uh, I won't take my D on the weekends because I know I'm going to be out there for at least 30 minutes and I'm going to get sun exposure. You don't run into... Uh, uh, you don't run into problems with risk of skin cancer unless you're burning yourself and you generally aren't going to burn at 20, 30 minutes. If you go too low in your vitamin D level, you'll have risk of melanoma. Oh, too low. Well, well, oh, I thought, I thought, you know, if, if you get too much sun, okay, you're going to get melanoma. Well, when, when I lived and practiced in the Northwest, I, I diagnosed twice uh, as much twice as much melanoma than I ever did practicing in San Diego for a decade or more. And okay, I mean, well, I, I have personal thoughts that I don't think it's the sun causing as much damage as our diet. Oh no, oh yeah, but but as far as as far as the vitamin D and that role, it's because it's regulating your immune system, oh, and it's it's I, a ster it's a steroid hormone, and it's built on the same chassis as the testosterone. Right. Is built two steps off the cholesterol molecule. So, with supplements, then, because there's so many to cover, would you recommend maybe somebody get a pretty extensive test, blood work, and you know, kind of see what they're lacking? But just just a go to would be a, a good multivitamin mineral. Yeah, uh, most most people, uh, I you know, I, I focus on the I focus on the diet, and you need a whole food diet. You need nutrient dense foods, but. Okay, as far as a, a multivitamin mineral, okay, yeah, that's fine. A good quality one, and that's not too spendy. The vitamin D is very inexpensive as well. Um, other uh, other items, um, depending on if they have comorbidities or things damaged from you know age. Um, my gosh, there's so many supplements. I, I've known people that were spending a thousand dollars a month on all types of high priced supplements and were they better for it well not really and uh, we could whittle it down and i've, I've done that for many people and i go well you, you don't need to be taking in all of that uh, as far as um uh supplements for your immune system well high levels okay. of vitamin c when when you become ill with something something's entering your yeah uh yeah i ramp up the c so uh for instance during covid um people in the hospital that were suffering from severe covid their levels of ascorbic acid vitamin c were at the level of scurvy okay oh okay well why because your immune system is highly utilizing vitamin c it's yeah. it's just part it's one little spoke in the wheel yeah um, during COVID, the patients hospitalized, severe COVID. Uh, the high, one of the highest risk factors was low glutathione. They found out uh, that was uh, significantly correlated with worse outcome. Well, glutathione uh, comes from your liver. It's one of the most important, if not the most important, uh, antioxidant. Yeah. Yeah, in your body. Now, how do you raise it? Well, you could take uh, liposomal glutathione. It's a little more spendy than taking NAC, N-acetylcysteine. And N-acetylcysteine raises glutathione. So we've used that for forever. I, uh, in the hospital, we use it, uh, mucormist. Um, it's uh, mucolytic and anti-inflammatory for the airways. Wow, good stuff. Uh, we've used it in the respiratory wings for decades. Uh, in the emergency room, we give it in super- high doses, and it uh, nullifies detoxes, uh, acetaminophen, Tylenol overdoses. So 
vitamin C in high doses? Oh, no, this is NAC. Oh, oh NAC, okay. NAC is N-acetylcysteine. Oh, NAC, and, yeah, yeah, they try NAC. to sell that supplements available too. Right, yeah, and so uh, anyhow, it, it's it, I've used it for years uh, oh. for all my chronic lung patients, okay? And all of a sudden, you know, they're able to uh, avoid as many exacerbations and flare-ups. It was a really good thing, but it's it's super good for that. So with COVID, yeah, uh, they found that um, low glutathione levels were, you know, higher risk. So anyway, that's, I've used that, my, my patients, my arsenal for 25 years, I've used that along with C, okay? When people come down with the flu or the colds, or in this case, COVID, but, um, uh, you had the FDA uh, uh, under pressure by a pharmaceutical company, starting with the letter P. Uh, they were trying to get them to pull NAC off the shelves, mm. on the shelves for decades, you know, 50, 60 years. So why now? Because people are using it to treat or uh, ameliorate COVID. Okay, well, anyway, it's, they, they backed down on that and it's still out there. Uh, the next uh, one for the immune system, uh, uh, if you're looking at RNA viruses, uh, zinc. Okay, well, zinc is, uh, it inhibits viral replication. You have to take enough of it. You can't take a higher dose for a long time because it's going to affect your copper metabolism. But you take that and uh, it will inhibit that, shorten that. So it works for influenza, it works for COVID, works for all of the Right. RNA viruses. But in order to get it inside the cell, you need something like an ionophore, which here I use quercetin. You're familiar with that? Yeah, that was quercetin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So quercetin is a bioflaminol that, that you're going to find. Is that the Q enzyme? No, yeah, no, okay. it's different. Uh, the well, what people uh, just, so, just so people know, the, the zinc, you mentioned this, the, the zinc needs a delivery system into the cell. So well, that, this is, this is one of the this is one of the benefits of using it with quercetin because quercetin will drive the zinc inside intracellularly so it can be used. Uh, you'll get some in, but to get more in, that's that's the goal. And so the quercetin it comes in apple skins. You know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, anyway, uh, you'd have to eat a bushel of apples to get a dose, though. But um, but the quercetin is uh, very interesting. I've, I've used it for probably 30 something years for treating uh, people with allergies. Why? Uh, it stabilizes mast cells that release histamine. Well, it doesn't inhibit them. It actually, it's the epigenetics. It basically turns on the, uh, the, the, the genes as they should be. Okay. Uh, and you know, the epigenetics are how we control our our genes, the, the code on top of the code. So anyway, quercetin does that for the mast cells. Well, it also works on other white blood cells. It's not just mast cells. So it actually helps you with your immune response. So you get a two for, um, so I use the, uh, the, the acid vitamin C, I'll use the NAC, I'll use the zinc, I'll use the quercetin. And then I make sure, okay, if they're taking D, I, I tell them you triple that dose for three days um, and then back off to your maintenance. You're not going to run into problems with that. So but, in a nutshell, then with supplements, I would just say, leave it at, at this, that people need to do a little bit of research and understand why they're taking it, why they need it, and maybe get rid of a lot of the things that you know, like you said, you're taking five supplements, but if you're not eating healthy and exercising, it, they're not going to they're not going to counteract. And you can have um, you know overkill, over toxicity. If you're putting too much, uh, you know, I need to take this and this and this and this and this and all the branch chain amino acids. I need electrolytes three times a day. You could be having too many electrolytes, and so you know, just being right. I, yeah, I I try to ta tailor to what what are what are our goals? Okay. Someone with uh, heart problems, if I'm trying to lower blood pressure, um, okay, uh, I might be using magnesium, okay? I might be using magnesium for sleep. I might be using it for anxiety or uh, muscle spasms or cramps or decreasing migraine headaches. Uh, it depends on what 
I'm, I'm actually treating. Um, so uh, for people that have other heart problems, I might be uh, using um, mitochondrial support that that might include CoQ10, COQ10, ubiquinone, ubiquinol. Ubiqui uh, red, red yeast. Okay. Uh, that's, that's for cholesterol. Yeah, more cholesterol. Okay. Okay. But the, um, but the CoQ10, actually, that's one of the, the factors uh, inside the mitochondria with the electron transport, and it's kind of stuck between the first two molecules. But if you don't have it there, you can't make ATP. Mm. You can't make ATP, you're dead. That's okay. like the, Q, the Q enzyme, Q, cubiquinol. Ubiquinol. Ubiqui it's ubiquitous. It's oh, yeah, ubiquitous. ubiquitous. And so it's you. Well, let's, let's, I mean, we could go down the rabbit hole here with supplements, but um, just to maybe give people a, a snapshot real quick. Um, it, you know, it's all mentioned, a lot of that's mentioned in your book, The Lost Art of Fasting in a Gluttonous World, but trying to get down to that more of an ideal body weight, um, smaller portions, intermittent fasting. Uh, God-given healthy food, exercise. I mean, it's all the things we already know, but what, what your book and what you did here is we break it down why this is so important. Um, and I think encouraging people to fall forward. You know, a lot of your, all your clients who succeed didn't do it perfectly. You know, no. they, they blew it on Saturday or they blew it at this family dinner or they, you know, the key is to really get back up and keep fighting again. And remember at the, at the end of the day, your spiritual health, your relationship with God is the foundation on which, you know, all of this has to be, has to be built. I was taking all these, all these notes and, and writing, yeah. but I don't want to know if you want to leave. Yeah. With the well, yeah, no, I, um, I, I, I met this guy, I met this guy back in 1980. Uh, and he was, a. Uh, I thought he was old at the time, but <laughs> yeah, then I met him many years later. Uh, but he, he was, you know, he was, I guess he was retired in 1980, but uh, he was a, he was an evangelist and he was traveling around the world and he had already been in Africa and Asia and, and um, a lot of um, uh, even middle, the middle East. And so he had a history of just uh, uh, traveling around the world. And he was constantly busy. Now uh, fast forward when I was living in the Northwest, one of my patients, uh, he was a pastor and his, uh, his wife, uh, was also a patient of mine. And she, she said, Hey, um, I want you to meet my uncle. And I said, your, your uncle, who's your uncle. And so she told me, and I said, Oh, Oh, I know who he is. I, I met him in 1980. Well, this wow. is like, uh, this is like 2000. I don't know. Where was it? Uh, uh, probably 2010 or something like that. And um, so what is it, 30 years later? Well, this guy is still tra traveling around the world, and he's coming into town, and uh, he was visiting her. And uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I had met him. I had, I had met him. I was just early in medicine, and I had a lot of questions for him. But um, the people that were working with him. Now, this guy is nearly 90, okay, and he's still going strong. Now, they're half his age, but they can't keep up with this guy. And I wanted to know, well, well tell me about that. Well, he won't, he only eats um, healthy food, and he brings the food with him. And so, his response to, well, why are you doing that? Because God's not me yet. When he's finished with me yet, I'm ready and happy to go. But I'm not going to be taken out because of my poor discipline. He says, so I'm going to, I'm going to take care of my temple. I'm going to take care of my body until it's time for me to go. Now, wow. this guy, his, his wife had passed on. His uh, daughter was helping him with the minister, but he says, oh, uh, I'm flying over to, he was going somewhere over in Asia. And he said, he said, no, the Lord is calling me. He says, here, I just wrote a couple new books on this whole topic. And he says, here you go. And uh, so this guy is going well at 90. So Even anyway, right, now? right now, no, this was back this in was, the early this 2000s. Was back in, uh, you know, I don't know, 2010, maybe. What did he say, though? His, he only ate healthy no matter where he went. Yeah, he brought his food with him because he says, I can't afford 
to be taken out. And he says, hey, you know, the, the enemy wants to take me out. Okay. Come to me with this or that. And he said, look, I'm, I want to be with Jesus, but I don't want to get out early. So Amen. to me it was like, I was already doing this stuff, but I thought, oh my gosh, he's a role model for me. Wow. That is awesome. Well, Dr. Paul, thank you so much. Um, and again, there, your website's probably the best spot to go. Dr. Paul Brillhart. Hey, uh, well, that'll be the link for the, that'll be the link for the book. Book, book Dr. when it's available. Dr. Paul Brillhart. Dot com. Dr. Paul Brillhart dot com. And we'll put it in the description of YouTube, you know, some of the, the links as well. So anyway, thank you so much. Any final comments or do you think we covered a lot of stuff here? Uh, we've covered a lot. But with um, the bottom line with your fasting book is um, we should all be intermittent fasting to some degree, I think, instead of just keep caving in, you know. I, I think this is as I mentioned before, it's the, it's the default state of man. Okay. Yeah. This is what we were designed to do True. and take advantage of it. The Lord put that into your body and the machinery is there, whether you want to use it or not, yeah. but it's, uh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, we have, there's so much we haven't said, but yeah, I mean, it's anti-aging. It's, uh, it's good for your heart. It's good for your mind. Uh, it, uh, boy, getting into that also, uh, what it does for your brain, my uh, the the benefit is just endless. And the reason we wrote the book was to show, and not just about fasting, but there's science behind it that we never knew. It's That's only true. in the last twenty years that this has really been kind of teased out and uncovered because we didn't true. understand the you know the epigenome at that time um, before then, and uh, so it's it's crazy wonderful it's not a panacea doesn't right. do everything but i think people should start and kind of just venture you know dip their toes in the water yep exactly i agree 100 percent. so anyway i want to thank everyone for watching uh this episode of idleman unplugged thank you